It's my duty to please the booty. And Muzz got mad at me, the coach, and he goes, Jesus Christ, why don't you just wear two nines? And I went, okay. Ah, ah, switch it oh. Please, please, please never do yeah, that. Yep. So. Hello, everybody. Welcome to episode 473 of Spit and Chicklets, presented by Pink Whitney from our friends at New Amsterdam Vodka. Here in the Barstool Sports Podcast family, what's going on, everyone? We have a legend coming back. A legend in the league has arisen the last week or so. So we got lots to talk to first. Let's go to Paul Biz Nasty Bissonette. What is shaking, brother? See you back out in the dirty desert. What's going yeah, on, buddy? You guys are starting with me today. Uh, great weekend. I ended up going to uh, sit courtside. Got splinters in my toes. Uh, Suns versus the Denver Nuggets. Got to see Kevin Durant. And what's the, what's the other guy's name? Joke Jokic? Jokic. Oh, he's fucking unreal, Jokic. man. Oh my God. He is th- th- watching these two guys going at it, man. What a what a fun thing to go experience. I'd never sat that close at a basketball game with. Have you? Have you ever been courtside? I I, I have not been first row like like I you wasn't were. either. Oh, you weren't? Okay. So no, I, was I was second row. If you yeah, remember, same. it was when I was dancing behind the guy from the office. Um I don't remember his name actually. I think his name DJ was Novak. Ryan in the off. What? DJ Novak, the biggest scumbag on planet yeah, Earth. Yeah, exactly. The oh. guy who turned it. Grinelli hates his guts. Um, yeah. but that was my one experience. And I remember coming on the pod. Actually, it was last year, right about now, because I remember oh, it was really? right around Thanksgiving. And Biz, I had been to NBA games before, sitting, you know, in normal seats. It 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 blows it out of the water. Oh, it, buddy! It, 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 it's, it's being able to hear them like talk shit and the size of them and actually oh, yeah. how athletic it are. It gave me a little more appreciation for that shitbag league known as the NBA. I was I was basically jock sniffing. I was right beside the bench because uh, my friend Coach Dar has the season tickets. She works with the players as a mental coach, so she. So is she me- your mental coach? No. Uh, we have not. <laughs> I I should start using her. That's for sure. Yeah, we she's have- like, uh, when are you going to hire me? I've listened. <laughs> Listen to you talk. You have serious no. issues. <laughs> That's all of my friends. They could all be my fucking life coach. But uh, no, we haven't done that yet. We've just kind of like hung out as friends, like hiking and, and and whatever. Like I got a couple gal pals. I got a girl in Vancouver, Jackie the Alien. Gee, have you met Jackie the Alien? Oh yeah, she's the best. Oh, buddy, she's just a wild. You're going child. to Cabo with her soon, correct? Yes, I'll be spending Christmas in Cabo with them. They're Jewish, so they don't celebrate Christmas, so they. You know, a little bit more laid back, go to Cabo, soak in some sun. And and are you one of those guys that's like smart enough to know like you can never put a gal pal on the workbench because it just would change no. everything? Oh, buddy, too. yeah. I, I, I remember one uh, one summer I ended up spending like a, what, probably about five weeks with her. We would sleep in the same bed and there's never a chicken dick's chance we would touch each other. It's like straight gal pal. Like, like even like fr- maybe a fr- back rub to help her fall asleep nothing, or no? Nothing. Like zero. It's just not, it's just okay. not, it's not operating like that. Now, so let you, me ask that, you something. Why, <laughs> why, why would you be in the same bed then? Well, because I, I I was staying at her place at the time and she just bro- broken up with her boyfriend at that time. And it just like it was better than sleeping on the couch. And I it was hard to find a place at the time. And it just saving out. some like, money, just in typical sa- saving some fashion. dough. Yeah, yep. I just I mean, keep in mind, this is going back like seven years ago. Right. So um, the back to I'm surprised your, your mental career. coach didn't show up. And like there was a random guy you'd sold your, your wood seats to from the game, <laughs> make a little cash on the side. <laughs> I got my concessions paid for. I'm in the nosebleed. It's like, who, who the fuck is this random? I sent you the ticket. It's like, oh, yeah, throw her up on game time. <laughs> <laughs> but hey, so my experience uh, at the NBA game, I would say for somebody who's not boozing right now, it's the closest thing to like a nightclub vibe that you could probably get to. There's like a, obviously a lot of beautiful women in the lower bowl. I'm sure some of them are pay for play. There for <laughs> the, the players are probably got them sitting courtside. You know, something to look Ronnie at. Tina. <laughs> yeah, there. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and uh, and you you know you get there. I think it was an eight o'clock start, and then we, they got access to this lounge in the back. It's got food there. If I mean, if you want the booze, it's there. And then you walk out underneath, and it's just like the perfect time too. You go out there for the for the one half, and then you're underneath afterward for or between for a little bit, and then you come back out. It was a great game, and I I'd, I'd never seen two big dogs go at it like that. So it was Durant and that Joker guy, <laughs> and I tell you that joke. It doesn't make sense how he's so good. He I. His body, I don't want to like be body shaming here, but if he's you like look at his- He's like a big RA. He's, he's RA. It's, it's R, somehow he figured out his athleticism despite the lack of muscle tone he has. If you look at his bicep, there's no 
there's no like it doesn't definition. There's no definition. It's it goes straight from his shoulder down to his elbow. Have you have you noticed that? Yeah, he's. It doesn't look like a, a professional athlete for sure, but he's I mean, phenomenal we, out there. When we say looks like RA as far as a body, we're not we're not over exaggerating. He kind of like looks like him with hair. overall. Yeah, in college, RA in college, <laughs> oh, with little, arrows, maybe. Yeah, yeah but Joker, <laughs> Joker, whatever his name is, wasn't a he wasn't a journalism major. So let's not get too carried away with oh. the college part, right? Like I think know, he, he was, was just a straight up Euro League Euro stepping yeah. his. The, the one thing that impressed me the most is when he would get to the basket, how good his hands were. He, yeah. You think that the guy would have him closed off and he'd dish it off the other hand, just a little flick of the wrist, and it was in every time. So he was great. Uh, no uh, Booker. And then the other guy on the other team who was – he's a Canadian guy. Is Jamal Murray? Murray? Jamal Murray. So neither of those guys played, so you didn't have the two wagons going at it from each side. But overall, close game, and I would recommend it to anyone. I would. What for, was for, uh, – um, like what what was that arena like like is that a pretty sick place like it's a it's a good spot to have a game i would say phoenix's downtown's not popping that much it's a pretty it's a sleeper downtown but a uh, beautiful facility they did a huge reno to it uh they got the baseball diamond right there but usually like after work time it's it's ghost town if there isn't a, a game going on so uh it's it's this whole area is kind of weirdly spread out I was obviously trying to, if it was up to me, they would have the NHL playing out of there too, which they already did way back when. Yeah. But the way that the um, arena is designed, it's designed more for basketball. So people on the upper deck at, like where who are way back in the nosebleeds, you wouldn't be able to see pretty much 75% of the defensive zone for the, for the closest D zone to you. I believe it's like that on both sides. For the behind the net people you're saying. So, uh, yes, like if you're behind the net on one yeah. end and you're in the nosebleeds up top, like basically majority of the upper bowl, you can't really see the defensive zone on the closest side here too. So that became a bit of a pain in the ass and I'm sure a reason why they ended up moving out of there. Although I also heard there was like a little bit of conflict between both owners and obviously they've never resolved it and, and here we are. But uh, it was a great weekend, boys. Had, had fun that night and then just kind of got some workouts in, hit the recharge button. And then uh, hang out, hung out with the boys on Sunday. So that's pretty much all I got. Yeah, other, other than hockey, pretty much their main reason they had to go to Glendale or well, go elsewhere because of, because of that whole situation where you know people couldn't see that whole uh, part of the arena. But yeah, I think that they they yeah, thought of a certain it. yeah, yeah. I don't know. <laughs> just a wee bit. Next up, the Wit Dog Ryan Whitney Wit Shake Me Who Pal. How was your weekend uh, since the last time we chatted? Uh, great weekend. Uh, pretty low key. Um, didn't do much at all. Uh, Saturday, what was, oh, it was rainy. That was the problem. It was rainy, man. I, I, when it's raining and it's cold, that's just such a kick in the dick. But, um, I played a lot of ping pong, played a lot of ping pong, uh, just smashing the ball, just serving like a monster. I'm very confident with my game right now. We still have to kind of figure out what I'll win when I dust G, um, whenever this, this entire ordeal goes down. Um, you know, and then Ryder had uh, he had a little hockey game Sunday. After that, little birthday party. My niece turned thirteen. She's a teenager now. It's crazy. I met her when she was four years old, and all of a sudden she's thirteen. I'm like, where's the time going? I don't know. But it was very chill. I kind of needed that. I think the I mentioned the the amount of drinking and eating over Thanksgiving. It was just one of those things where I was catching up all week on some sleep, catching up on rest, watch a bunch of hockey. Watch the Dallas Stars completely shit pump the Tampa Ooh. Bay Lightning Ooh. on Sunday. I mean, Little Tampa's pep talk from Coop. Right after we pump oh. Tampa's tires, what do you, what do you think happens? The chicklets dump. That's what it's called, right? It's the chicklets. <laughs> what did dump. Merle send to the group chat? It's like we talked to Kalorn. They, they hadn't won a game since. I think they were zero and seven. They lost and eight then, in a row in regulation at one. Oh, I think Jesus. then they beat Colorado. But <laughs> oh, jeez. And then uh, and then Devin Levi get uh, you know comes on, then he gets sent to, to the AHL. Oh, anybody yeah. else, boys? Eh? Any, yeah. Any, anybody else? We're going to put the torpedo. Torpedo. Jesus hey, I'm Christ. surprised you haven't mentioned this yet, considering you're you're such a a hardcore Georgia football fan. Buddy. Very difficult loss. I think that they should have gotten in, though. Um, I, I actually can. I, I'm biased, but I, I'll admit I don't think they deserve to get in. Um, it, it's one of those things like you, you win 29 straight, straight games, number back to back national championship. But 
it, it, what really screwed it up was Washington, right? Like them going undefeated and then the Pac-12, them getting in. I mean, f- put it this way, like as a Georgia fan, Florida State fans have a way bigger, uh, what is that word? Gripe. 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 G-R-I-P-E. Gripe. Because for them to go undefeated in a Power 5 conference and knock it in, like that's just such a kick in the dick for those kids. And, and, and I actually don't even disagree with it because I think Bama would smash them because their QB's out. I think maybe two QB's are out. But yeah, they, they said that injuries... Do you believe that injuries should play a factor in the decision-making? I, I kind of do because you're, you're looking for... Like I, I know I'm talking out both sides of my mouth here, but you're looking for the four best teams, which I guess is Georgia fans' arguments. That's what, that, uh, right. that's what their coach said. It's like, we're one of the four best teams in the country, but... If your star QB's out, man, and then you looked that bad, they beat Louisville. Their defense was amazing. This is Florida State I'm talking about um, in the ACC final, but they looked so bad on offense that it's like, man, it's just it's it's really hard to do what they ended up doing, and it ended up being the perfect storm as college football is going to a 12 team playoff next year. It's like this had to happen the yeah. last season. Well, that because like so many of these top teams can like run the table and then win their conference, where it's like. If you win your conference, regardless of how shitty it is, let's say it's the sixth strongest conference, should you not at least get in if you're doing a 12-team situation? What do you mean? Like, like what's the the fifth and, and sixth strongest conferences? Like, if like you're saying uh, Florida State University, they won out um, and they won their conference, yet yeah. maybe it's it's the fifth strongest conference therefore they didn't get in well it's you know probably based on the strength of their conference where is if you make it 12 teams can't you just guarantee whoever wins their conference in enough of the conferences that you yeah. automatically get in yep. like that should be the case regardless of how shitty now that you have 12 teams for next year is that I so love that's the, the fact case? that they're doing that i, I i've seen why some not complaints. eight though um because the top 4 will get buys and then oh. then then of the eight teams remaining, so five money, plays money. 12, money. six plays 11, all those first games I read, could definitely be wrong on this, but I'm pretty sure I read, are at the highest seeds barn or field. I guess I'm in hockey. Yeah, I know, right barn. Now. I like the barn. So that's pretty sick, man. Like, all of a sudden, if, if that was happening this year and say, I, I don't even know the team, say Penn State's playing Iowa or something, like, it's in Penn State's field or at oh, their wow. at campus. That That's pretty cool. That's cool. That's People cool. complain there'll be a bunch of blowouts, but like, who doesn't want to watch like more football, especially college, high level college football? So I think it's great. But Georgia, no man, they they lost to Bama, t- three point game. They were brutal at the start. They weren't they weren't throwing the ball enough, and it was it was kind of a bummer. But you know, I then drove in and, and watched BU smash Merrimack on an amazing third period comeback. So all, all's good in my life. I'm not losing any sleep over it, Biz. I, I'm a fair weather fan. People know that about me. So um, I think it brings up the conversation of uh, Tom Brady chirping the NFL. I, uh, he, I think that was about probably a day or two after we'd already recorded. What One, what do you make of his comments? And to me, the last couple of years, I haven't been as interested in the NFL. I feel like it's just like there's something like the I agree with part of what he's saying. And it's funny because Torts ends up coming out with his comments shortly thereafter about how Brady's basically saying you're taking the defense out of it. Like the amount of penalties guys get for just basic contact were when he came in. So if anything, it's just kind of like a boring offensive league where there's not that there's you never see anyone to get rocked out there anymore, which is part of the allure of it. I don't want to see guys go down, but fuck. I mean, I like to see guys get hit through the middle if they're going up for one. Remember jacked up. Remember jacked up <laughs> oh, on yeah. uh, maybe he Sunday night that. countdown or something? They yeah. just show monster hits. And now if there's one, there's a flag. I mean, I, like the Eagles played the 49ers, right? I was kind of fired up for that. Next week, the Eagles play the Cowboys. Like I'm just looking for good games, and there's very, very few games that are really good now in the NFL. I think that's what you're saying. Yeah, uh, it, It's frustrating because I don't think that anything will really change because they still own Sundays. The ratings are still through the roof. Not until the and, NHL uh-oh, takes uh-oh. over. <laughs> what? Oh, yeah. Sorry. 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 Yeah, we're going to take over Sundays. That, that, that will happen. 
especially the officiating. I know I know we could say it about every sport, biz, but the end of that KC Green Bay lo- game last night, there was like three or four just egregious calls or non calls. They just they just leave a black eye on these games, especially if you're betting them, man. It's even more frustrating if you have. Well, money yeah, on that that doesn't frust me, <laughs> frustrate me as much as you are, right? But <laughs> I'd be interested to hear about the L that you took because of these these officials. No, no, I I actually had a quiet weekend. Uh, well, I get to, we'll get to my weekend in a second, but I, I didn't have that much up gambling over the weekend. But let's go to G Fresh. You just mentioned college, G. Let's go to you. You had a big uh, a commitment via chick. Oh, University, yeah. a big guy. Let's go. Let's hear it. Yeah, it's, it was a great week for Chicklets University. Uh, late last week, I got a text from the head of hockey ops at UMass that a kid actually recently committed to UMass, and the reason he committed was because of the Chicklets U video. So that's awesome to hear. Wow. And the week kept rolling. We uh, on Friday night, we ended up going to down to the Conti Forum, which is uh, BC's home rink, and we went and filmed oh, real, the video. Oh. Oh, I'll tell you what, though, Wit. The fans, it's so different. I grew up going to BC games and it was, the fans were horrible. There were no fans. You'd have the guys in the yellow t-shirts in the corner, but there was nothing. The whole entire arena was packed. Maybe it's because they're the number one team in the country, but uh, I was talking to the head of hockey ops there as well. And he said he's worked there 15, 20 years. He's never seen anything like this. So they got that line, the Leonard Perot and Will Smith line incredible they are just so dominant ryan leonard could step into the nhl tomorrow and play so could cutter gautier could you imagine but, what the what type of damage these weapons are doing at university right now oh my Will god Smith no. And no i really can't <laughs> i small town strip club we got tremendous feedback last week I, a new theme song we busted out the new episode with uh what have you been seeing on, on the socials as far as the song g we're gonna keep it is it, is it a keeper I think or there's it? a lot of positive feedback i think there's a lot of people that are receptive to receptive to the idea that it can be dethroned but, you know, sometimes late people get late to the back of the podcast because usually ours are about, what, three and a half hours long. So I would say from a YouTube and Instagram perspective, I've seen a lot of great reviews, um, maybe you know, not as many on Twitter, but there's a lot more negativity on Twitter. And we're going to oh. fucking get to that pretty soon. Oh. So shocker. Thanks a lot, Elon. I, I've um, seen a lot of great reviews, but I think one thing that's been really cool is when Biz mentioned that like Freestyle Friday thing of people trying to dethrone them, we're getting tons of intros now. Like so many different bands and artists and DJs are sending us tracks. So it's been pretty cool to listen to those and check them all out and to, to see someone try and dethrone them. Who Who's this girl who just posted a rap video and oh she's going to be God. she's going to be the next Cardi B, Glorilla? Glorilla. Glorilla. So, this, so this song she's is huge, right? The song is In the Trunk by Fendi DeRappa featuring Glorilla. <laughs> oh, wow. I mean, so, I mean, when, when, when you go into the lyrics, I, I, I like this one. Okay. She's going to eat that dick up good. I bought that pink Whitney. So, I mean, after that, <laughs> she done Bring fucked me and my brother, that bitch you seen. So, <laughs> we're, I mean, we're talking, hey, we're talking a classic here. I Holy mean, shit. I think everyone, all four of us could say when, when Pink Whitney was created up in our loft, in the loft in my house I'm not even in anymore, and Biz's idea and my wife telling me to do it, we all saw a future <laughs> Nicki Minaj uh, female rapper um, rapping about Pink Whitney and eating dick, correct? <laughs> 100%. <laughs> top of the list. Definitely. Top of the eating dick podcast. Just, definitely. just with a fork and knife, eh? I said to Jeff, sitting I go, around Jeff, the we dinner gotta table. send her some merch. <laughs> I'm like, I don't know if she'll wear the merch, but at least let's send it. I think we should get her on the pod. I'd love to hear about this dick Holy eating. shit. Uh, well, speaking of Pink Whitney. Like, yeah, I was at Boston College last week with some of the freshman <laughs> hockey players. Didn't Cornelli <laughs> tell you about it? Uh, gonna have in the fucking new lyrics. Oh, God. Oh. Uh, Biz, we got another Pink Whitney coming up. Uh, Pink Whitney night coming up January 23rd. Uh, Orlando, once again, the solo Biz, doing it, uh, running it back once again. Oh, eh? buddy, yeah. That was, was that so- last year, Biz, or two? No, two years ago. Two years ago. Oh, oh that was such a fun night. That one got off the rails. I, I couldn't believe you put the mascot outfit on. Oh, my God. We, we I kind of want to do it again. Funniest thing I've ever seen with, too. That <laughs> is. That was, that was lights out. So we uh, we did a three-part uh, ECHL series where we kind of tried to touch every little part of it. We did Orlando, who's got a great setup, the paradise of the ECHL, the accommodations the guys get to live in. They have these, like, they basically live on a resort, great, great uh, gyms and all that stuff, and we ended up going the game for the Pink Whitney night, and Witt ends up putting the fucking mascot costume on, and you nearly passed out. Yes, wave, yes. waves off the Crazy. camera with that giant fucking pull a bear palm. <laughs> I, I can't, I can't wait, I can't wait to go to that game. I mean, we we said it then, but I think it's is it January twenty sixth, G third, January twenty third, January twenty third. So 
I mean, I'm going to be all fired up to be there and, and kind of experiencing a top-notch ECHL like vibe yeah. because there's so many people at the game. Obviously, it's Pink Whitney night, so everyone's going to kind of come out for that, get get their shots, get their drinks. And then they, they have such a big arena that it's like an awesome vibe. So I'm looking forward to doing that again. And I believe it was Blade. Is that his name? Oh, Blade. Blade. Uh, the Bruins guy. I don't know. Is it the same? Uh, Orlando? Something maybe Blaze. Who knows? But yeah. I, I, I'm gonna I'm gonna see if I could do that again. Let's see if they were pleased or Shades. not with my performance. His name what? is Shades. 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 Oh. He wears the big sunglasses too. Yeah, that's yeah, right. Good. Hey, good memory, Wit. You were close. What's up, guys? Wit here. And before we go any further, yes, yes, yes. I'm here to talk to you about Pink Whitney, New Amsterdam's own Pink Whitney, the flavorful, amazing pink lemonade flavored vodka that we've all come to know and love, and I think with Thanksgiving done and Christmas around the corner, now the stockings are hung up and the trees up and it's the whole Christmas vibe. And then I just look at stockings and I think what fits in perfectly into a stocking, a big old bottle of Pink Whitney or a package of nips, 12 nips, boom, slide it right in. What else would you want in your stocking? It's the opposite of coal, motherfuckers. It's Pink Whitney. And also... Men's League Hockey. This is peak season. This is Beer League Hero Time. And our boys over at Chicklet Game Notes, Army and Murr, they talk about it a lot. And they talk about guys being responsible and, and bringing the beer. Well, I, I, I love the idea of just a bottle of Pink Wit with the 30-pack. Because then, you know, you have the, you have the, the, the hang around, we're drinking some beers, but then everyone gets a quick shot. And it just loosens up the mood. It loosens up the vibe. If you have a problem with your winger, well, if you have one or two beers, that's one thing. You have a shot of Pink Whitney, you might be able to be honest. A drunk man's words is a sober man's thoughts. That's what everyone says. So Christmas is here. Pink Whitney stocking stuffers. Awesome Pink Whitney merch in our store. Thank you to everyone who bought on Black Friday. I'm rocking the, the um, Pink Whitney Ski Club shirt myself right now, and I got the lid. We love our logo. We love New Amsterdam. We love Pink Whitney. And I cannot tell you how much I appreciate everyone who's ever bought a bottle or a nip. So continue on. Make Christmas special with Pink Whitney. And thanks again. Another day to mark down uh, December 13th, the next Sandbagger versus J.R. Tamu Solani. Can't wait for that. There's going to be some good stuff coming. Uh, Gee, uh, game notes situation. We had what? Whip dog last week. What's going on with the next one? Uh, game notes, 11 a.m. Uh, Thursday this week. Just breaking down. Merles has been hot, giving out picks. Uh, Army doing his thing. And yeah, 11 a.m. Eastern Army's got to get the Penguins power play going. Oh, Oof. wow. No goals last 10 games. Tough. They have done five everything. power play goals this year. Three of them were against the San Jose Sharks in one game, and they've given up four shorties. So, so, I mean, how do you have a bad power play with those players? I don't, I don't guy get wit. it. Stack guy wit, humming early. I don't I took get a, that. I, I took a lot of shit this offseason for saying this team's not a playoff team, and they are very much not a playoff team. Oh, Ooh, yeah, I did too, G, right, right alongside with you. Uh, we do have Michael Del Zotto coming on a little later. Interview we did a few weeks back. Uh, great personality. And funny enough, I, boys, as you know, I just got back from Toronto. I was up filming uh, my season three scenes for Shorzy season three. Uh, awesome stuff. I uh, can't wait till it comes to you. But I bumped into one of Del Zotto's coaches. Funny enough, I was at the airport and a guy came over to say hello. And he actually coached uh, Stamkos and uh, Del Zotto back when they were like, you know, 13, 14 years old. And he also coached Tyler Sagan. So he had some uh, off the oh, record wow. stories to share about the boys. So oh, just wow. a kind of funny coincidence that we're dropping him tomorrow and I bumped into his little that's coach. A lot so. of, that's a lot of big names to coach in minor hockey. Now, RA, how much of this top secret mission can you talk about it? It's season three of Shorzy that's going to be coming up. You did text in the group that you. You bumped into Jay on right again. You're usually in your scenes with him. So yep. how'd the whole experience go? What can you divulge? Uh, did you get to have a few pops with Terry Ryan? Like what was your, your trip like? Yep. Great week. And it's great now because if early on, we had to kind of keep things low key, but everything the cats out of the bag now. Yeah. I went up for my season three scenes. It's uh, the same scene partners. I have Jay on, right? A tremendous guy. I mean, uh, obviously, our American listeners probably aren't familiar with him. I describe him as the Scott Van Pelt of Canada. Uh, different personalities, but they do the same thing. They're the main drawer on the sports center in each country. Just an awesome guy. He comes so prepared. Because he, he doesn't have to peek, peek, at, yeah, peek at his sides, look at his lines at all. He knows them off the top. Uh, Tessa Bonholm is the, another scene partner. And uh, Kim Cloutier, who's an actor from uh, actress from Letterkenny. And it's you know it's this three years now. We kind of have, we're, we're the only four people that are in one scene together, I think, of the whole show. So, you know, we all kind of meet up. And we got a nice 
personal thing going now. Uh, I had a few beers with uh, Terry. We went to dinner both nights in a row. Also, uh, Mr. Nasty, John Morasty, the Nolan oh, yeah. brothers. Great to catch How up with all those guys. How did you get up there? Not, not at all, dude. I'm telling you, boys, this is like a working working trip. I get up there. I met Terry for dinner right away. I don't, what, are all trips? Heads, I get what are our trips? Yeah. yeah, exactly. Yeah, well, those are work hard, play hard trips. These are, <laughs> I, have to, I don't have to act on our trips. When I had to get up at 6 in the morning, go to set. I have my own trailer. You saw that I put it on my Instagram. Oh, I felt that like Rick putt fucking was all natural? Huh? Oh, great. I Yo, said I, that I, putt in the sandbacker was, was au naturel. <laughs> oh, great. No, it was great. Yeah, it was a work my, trip. I got my own trailer and stuff, which is pretty cool. It's gotten a little bit bigger each time. But yeah, it, it's just fun. And the best part- you know, a wolf when he shows uh, up on the table. Uh, just no, that's that's season eight and nine. That's no, on his so rider I, list. I waited at- <laughs> I, you know, I watched my season two stuff. I wasn't crazy about it. I just didn't feel I like brought the oomph. So this time out, like, I made sure to, like, you know, have, have the good energy. And, and I got a nice text from Jared when I was uh, commuting back. And he just had some nice words to say about my work and how it's gotten Did better. Did he not text just, you last year after yours? Um, he did. But this he, he didn't give this compliment before. He just said, you know, I don't know if you heard the people. Not that, a boy. That's everyone, good to everyone hear, right? the monitor, But that meant you were doing good. And like, you know, I was like putting a little emphasis on some of the words and I got to swear. That's the favorite part. Once I see swears in my fucking dialogue, it's great. So yes, uh, it gets paid to swear. Very you can't authentic. Beat that. Exactly. Very authentic. So yeah, it was a very successful trip. Uh, I don't know anything official, but I'd be surprised if that's the last time I go to Sudbury, Ontario. I'll leave it at that. You should and, buy uh, property there for fuck's sakes. You're the star of the show now, baby. <laughs> I don't know about that. And honestly, just finally, Jared Keeser, just just a great guy. Uh, we got to you know sit down and talk to him in between setups and takes and stuff. And he, he's just salt of the earth feller. And I, I can't thank what him enough for including me. Um, for your sweating problem, like during film. That's what makeup's for, baby. Because uh, yeah, because oh, I get out there. Makes dude. you not sweat. Yeah, they they put it on because I oh. kept asking. I felt like Albert Brooks in fucking uh, broadcast news. It feels like Niagara Falls coming down my head, but the the makeup just kind of like keeps it in, in in check or whatever. Because I mean, I sweat watching. All right, Sesame you should Street. start doing cold tubs. Um. Yeah, to you, cool you, your you, core temperature down. I mean, like, so what is it when you get worked up? You start sweating, like when you get nervous. I, I, not when even he nervous. wakes up, he starts. Yeah, sweating. I, I basically, oh, okay. I, get, I get up, I yawn, and it's like, I just, I don't know, I'm just a sweaty guy for whatever reason. I, I wasn't really nervous. It just like you know, you get on set and, and there's these huge lights everywhere. That that makes you sweat more than anything. But either way, it was, it was a great time. I can't wait till season three comes out. It'll probably be early sometime 2024. We'll obviously let you know if you haven't checked out season two yet. It's on Hulu. It's on Crave in Canada. I thought it was terrific. Uh, check it out if you haven't yet. So, and uh, for those guys to sweat we're... in a cold tub, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so you say, Viz? Um, <clears throat> for those of you, we, we were just talking about that ECHL series. We did two more videos. We did one in uh, Wheeling, West Virginia. That one was a riot. That was with uh, KB and Nick. And that's then the other got one the key was to the city. That's when I got the the key toke to the city, uh, and and to Godfathers. It was a two for one special. Uh, that's <laughs> the strip club in town. Uh, and then we did uh, more of a sentimental piece for uh, Derek Nesbitt's thousandth game. So go check that out on our Spit and Chicklets YouTube channel. Wait, since I've been talking about the YouTube, it has been humming. Are we at 310 yet? You think we're yeah. not? You think oh, we're yeah. not? We're closing in on 311. Wit. Oh, shit, oh, bitch. Don't forget about yeah. our other socials as well. Oh, wait, one last thing, too. I actually had to get a root canal right before I headed up there. Remember last week I was struggling? He was like, what's the matter? Uh, all right. I was like, I've had this toothache for a couple of days. I had to get a root canal right before I went up to fucking Sudbury oh, last wow. week. Yeah. Jeez, look at you Root are, canals, right? apparently, I haven't had one in, I think I had one 2019. Yeah, it was before COVID. And... Apparently, the the technology on it has changed significantly, where the pain is much less, and like I I, I think that's a huge difference because everyone dreaded them so much. Where now it's almost similar to a cavity, where it's not nearly as bad. Obviously, they're completely different, but I've had a few people tell me root canals lately went pretty smooth in terms of like what you think of when you hear root canal. I agree, a hundred percent. Really? Sorry to me to cut you. Yeah, yeah. I've had, unfortunately, that wasn't my first one. And yeah, you hear them. You hear How these reputations. How many have you had? I've had two. Uh, well, in probably the last 10 years, I've had two. So uh, yeah, they're not fun, but like, they're not like horrific. They're not like back in the 70s. You're not bleeding all over the place. You know, they numb you up and, and they, they do what they got to do. That's how but. they used to do it in the 70s? Well, they the, should just what, yank the tooth then. out. What I know. Mean? I just think the, the dental technology has gotten to the point where people on in agony like they, oh, okay. they used to be, and the, the tools are a little bit better. The technology's better. I, so. I, I think it's fair to say that none of us floss every day. I try oh, to floss. I, I, I floss. Don't floss it. You floss every day, Biz. I got those little things that you go up with the, pl so the every plastic day. ones. Oh yeah. Uh, like I mean, when I'm home, yeah, I got the bag okay. sitting out. So I'm. All right, I don't. They, floss they say every it day. helps for your uh, your brain too. 
like, like flossing. Did your mental coach tell you that on the Shut wood? Shut the fuck. <laughs> flossing. <laughs> You'll be flossing, biz. <laughs> no, buddy, I'm telling you, it's like the 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 all the the. Oh, for fuck! You got me all. No, I swear. Hey, I asshole. went to the dentist like a week ago, and they told me the same thing. There's there is like it's infects your gums, which the blood to your head. It's something crazy like that. But buddy, busy, even, your dentist said flossing helps your brain last week. I swear to God on my mother's soul. Sometimes I think whatever that. Biz says, you're just like, yeah, no. yeah, no, I know, I heard Come that. On, I wit. swear, I swear. Checks in the mail, Biz. So no, all right, I, I, what, I, I, yeah. I brought up flossing because I know you don't floss every day, and I, I don't either. Would <laughs> I, you rather I, floss every day or make your bed every day? Oh, floss every day. I floss way. I know I don't make my bed, and I floss pretty frequently. So yeah, I'm, really? I'm a big like. I have those things too. Yeah, biz. They have the toothpick on one end and the and the so string on the other. So apparently, that yeah. is not even close to like what an actual rip the floss off the little thing does like how apparently though? the the sticks with it attached is not nearly as good as flossing no. the old school way I'm that's what i stick, was told I, I'm after my the dentist stick. told me that if you floss it'll help your brain too <laughs> with the string with the string on the end though it has the, the toothpick on one end and then a little string on the end so you, it's like it is floss it's floss no, on i one. know but for some yeah. reason the guy was like yeah that doesn't do the job like real floss does i don't know <laughs> nah, fucking, no wonder why what, like, what the fuck do you believe anymore right uh, i know, can't believe anything I know. Do you believe? Uh, do, uh, but uh, I've been reading up a little bit on that like, gut health, though. Like, like obviously, what oh, you're ingesting so helps with your rage. brain as well. That's why I've been cooking a ton, boys. It's a little Have therapeutic. You? Oh, buddy! Like people are like, "What are you cooking?" I'm not mixing like fancy sauces. I'm keeping it very simple. Like the only thing I cook with is like organic butter, but just like you know, fish, uh, steak, uh, chicken, and then like the basic vegetables and and you know, potatoes, carbs, sweet potato. And Are just you like cooking this. steak on the on the on the I just outside? Cook it, I no, I just cook it on the oven. Really? Yeah, people are people are probably. Oh, yeah, I don't like the barbecue here. I don't even know how the fuck to use it, and I don't mind doing it over the just over the oven or like the the stove. Excuse me, Sto a little stove top steak, little st <laughs> stove top. But stuff. I'll, listen, you've been like, fucking you have grinding a, you me have all a grill right, right outside, now. right? Listen, I don't know, and I if it's just easier, it's easier. Get off my nutsack right well, now. Well, no, I'm my actually, I actually think it's not easier because the cleaning's so much less on on the grill. Oh, I just feel like it's all right there. You're all in one spot. You can get everything going. And then another thing too, I feel like it's very therapeutic for me. The whole process of like chopping up the veggies and stuff. That's what I've found has been. The, it's more of like kind of meditation. You have to be in the moment. You're using your hands, like. Yeah, oh, hey, my therapist told my me that. My therapist told me that that if I chop up veggies, I'll feel more clear-minded and stuff. I heard that. You are a what? fucking asshole. Hey, what? is this guy not a fucking asshole? My therapist told me that cut up some veggies, man, and you'll think clear as day. <laughs> One thing I miss living in a condo is is being able to cook on the grill, man. That's fucking just. I'm in, my, in my I'm in my kitchen with a samurai sword cutting veggies. <laughs> He's got like his uh. He's, I got the George Foreman grill music out. As like he's I'm fucking his pepper. Another nut. Pepper, like <laughs> focusing on his TNT show and just slices his thumb off. He's like, Jeff, call the ambulance. <laughs> Jeff, hold on. Jeopardy's coming on. I got a floss. Get ready for it. Oh, for All right, fuck's boys. Sakes. Should we get on to a yeah, little hockey yeah, talk here? What? My balls busted. Right. Wit's got the fucking the boxing gloves on, <laughs> like the lady in the <laughs> porno with the right ball now. sack to the massage oh, table. I'm getting speed bagged online, so I'm just taking it out on you guys. Yeah. I love you, Aria. It happens. Yeah. It All happens. Right. All right, boys. The Patrick Kane sweepstakes Woo! has been decided in the three-time Showtime. or showtime, baby. He, he joined Chicago's old nemesis, the Detroit Red Wings. Uh, a one-year, $2.75 million deal. Of course, he's recovering from the hip resurfacing surgery. What they do is they shave down the femur, they put a cap on it, and then they kind of slap it back in. Uh, Biz and the TNT crew had a nice chat with him last week. Uh, him and Just a doctor, little deep call they are there with. Just throw a little deep cold on there. <laughs> What's a, a little deep, deep cold? tissue? Oh, I, like icy hot. Oh, yeah. You know, no, the just trainers. Yeah, I throw a little tub. icy hot on it. Who gives a shit? He really he, there, all they the they jocks. just cut his femur and then he sat in the cold tub. He's good to go. <laughs> but all right, I mean, I, like, all joking aside, a very very serious procedure. Mm -hmm. um, from my understanding, only four NHLers have been through this process. Ed Jovanovski, 
Yep, played 37 games. Uh, Ryan Kessler didn't play after. Uh, Kyle Hagelin did not play after. Nick Backstrom played 47 games. Doesn't look like he's going to be able to play again. Uh, of course, tennis star Andy Murray, he was 500th in the world when he was injured, got the surgery. Now he's up to number 42 in the world. And as Elliot Friedman pointed out in his video, uh, The Undertaker was able to defend uh, four times straight at WrestleMania after getting the surgery. I don't know if he was uh, joking about that. Steve Eisman, a big part of the decision was he believes in the technology for the surgery has gotten a lot better. So, gee, let's send it over to the the audio from that night, uh, night uh, biz talk to him on TNT there. It's like a root canal. Patrick, thanks so much for joining us. Congrats. The newest Detroit Red Wing. Henrik Lundqvist has the first question here. Kaner, uh, obviously a lot of speculation where you were going to end up. Can you take us through your thought process of making this decision? Yeah, I think uh, probably about two or three weeks ago we started uh, – interviewing with teams that uh, were either interested or I was interested and uh, kind of went from there. Um, uh, so, you know, it was uh, it was a tough decision for sure, um, especially, you know, through the whole process. It was felt like a long time. You know, it's been about almost six months and, since the surgery. So you never really know when, where you're going to play next. And, uh, um, you know, I think my my heart was in Detroit. You know, I would I would think about a a place and uh, be all about that place for a day, and then, you know, my heart, and my mind would uh, for for some reason always come back to Detroit. So it seemed like the uh, the right fit for me, and I was uh, you know obviously happy they were interested as well. Kaner, congratulations, it's Ace. Uh, how much of an impact did Stevie Eisman have in your decision to sign with the Detroit Red Wings? Yeah, it was big. I mean, it was, uh, you know, I came away very impressed uh, talking to him and, uh, and the head coach, Derek Lalonde, here uh, with our meeting. And, um, you know, there's just a certain presence about him, obviously, when you talk to him. And he seems very dialed in. I think uh, they definitely wanted to go through the process the right, the right way, too, and just, you know, making sure they were happy with where I was at physically and uh, happy with, um, you know, everything that went on with the surgery and, and all that. So um, it was nice to kind of clear all the physicals yesterday and get done with all of that. And um, I think everyone was pleased and uh, go from here. Patrick, you said that uh, you were thinking about different teams, but every time your heart kept coming back to Detroit, when you kept going back to Motown and seeing that city, how often were you seeing Alex to bring it and thinking about the things you guys did together in Chicago? Yeah, I mean, that's that's a huge reason. There's no doubt about it. Had a lot of success with him in uh, in Chicago playing there the last couple of years we were there. And um, he's a great kid. He's a fun kid to be around. I think we were uh, we were very close on the ice, obviously, but even even off the ice as well. He became one of my one of my better friends. So enjoy being around him every day. Just his competitiveness, the way he loves the game, he loves hockey, his uh, his passion for the game. And um, I think one of the things I really respected about him was just, um, you know, the fact that he wasn't he wasn't afraid to tell me what to do on the ice or, or give it back to me if we were, you know, getting a little bit heated on the bench or something like that. So a lot of respect for him, and it was uh, it was a big reason. Showtime biz here. Uh, first off, I think I speak for all hockey fans, but we're pumped to see you back. Uh, one of the best American-born players ever, if not the best American-born player. I have a two-part question. How grueling was the surgery and, and process of all of it as far as rehabilitation? And is there anything about your stride or anything that you've had to change after getting this resurfacing surgery? Yeah, so, I mean, I tried to work hard at the rehab, obviously, and um, put a lot of time and effort into it. Um, you know, the thing about it was like two or three days after the surgery, I wasn't feeling the pain that I was feeling the last couple of years. So it was almost refreshing right away. Obviously a big surgery and, uh, um, you know, when you're here four to six months or it was probably always like six, six or seven months, to be honest with you. Um, you know, it's going to be a long time, but put in the time and effort and, um, you know, feel a lot better as far as the stride change. Um, no, I don't think so. I mean, if, if anything, I'm able to uh, put a lot more weight onto the right side now, which I wasn't able to do the last couple of seasons. So I feel like my my lateral movement and my agility is a lot better than it was and even just my stride in general doesn't feel like I'm kind of flaring out my hip or anything I can I can fully extend so feels good on a lot of fronts just um you know it'll be uh, it'll be nice to get back in game action here and uh and get going and um start playing hockey again I got one more follow up I don't want to get Detroit fans too excited but 
How confident are you you can get back to the Patrick Kane we've seen come playoff time, the one doing the pumper nickel and the heartbreaker to that level? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, very confident, very confident. Um, you know, I know for a fact I'm going to be better than I was, was last year. And even the year before, I mean, put up decent numbers, but it was, uh, I, c- I couldn't really, I couldn't really move laterally side to side. A lot of, a lot of my plays were just kind of, uh, peg leg planted. So it was, uh, um, it was a good decision. I'm happy with it all. And, um, very confident about getting back to a, to a high level of play. What's a root canal? Him having a talk to me? No. <laughs> <laughs> Me having a I was, talk. That was five minutes ago. You said that, by the way. That by the time the people are done listening to that interview, so I don't know if that joke is. No, actually I meant the land. technology and the surgery. Oh, oh okay, okay. Biz, yeah, you know what? I, I that was a great interview, and I got to give you a lot of credit. You now tell me if I'm wrong, but it, it seemed like you kind of asked like couple tough questions i mean you weren't walter cronkite in the guy but <laughs> but you you kind of brought up like do you think you can be the same player and, and these guys haven't been able to do it i was impressed by that yeah no I, I all of us tackled that interview well and obviously thanks to showtime for, for 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 giving us the time and you know anytime you have that type of access especially coming out with what he's been through over the last probably nine months well at least what i thought and one of the questions was how grueling was the process and he he backdated it man he's been dealing with pain on this hip and hasn't really been able to put weight on it, you know, over the course of the last two years. And one of the other things too, is he said the, the best part about it was about two to three days after surgery, he was relieved completely of his pain. And that's the thing with, as you know, like it fucks with your brain, like waking up every day. I mean, I would imagine hip pain would be just as painful as back pain, where when you have it, it's like, there's no escaping it unless, unless you're basically lying down. And, and in some cases, like, I don't know if pain pills were being used or he was trying to go the natural route, but I know when I herniated a disc in my back, I was fucking toast, man, anti-inflammatories and had to take pain pills just to get through it. So the fact that he was even able to try to play through it last year too, which was probably the most surprising thing. Then you see some fucking idiot Rangers fans online. And this, this is majority of, of why I fucking hate them. And, and it's because of their idiot fans online. They were bitching about how they, you know, why didn't we know that last year before giving up assets? Didn't they just give up a fucking third round draft pick for Patrick Kane? Is that all they gave up for him? Am I crazy here? The 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 entire thing is is foolish on the fan base side because I'm pretty sure that Drury and everyone knew he knew. was battling an injury. Yeah. Like, That's just how dumb about? they are. Cowbell lady, fucking subway sucker punch guy, and then the rest of the fans on Twitter. So the Fugazis can fuck off. But as far as the what I took away from it, and you just it was a second and a fourth biz. Sorry, to okay, jump second in, and fourth. Third. We'll meet, we'll meet in the middle. Uh, third, uh, <laughs> but. Uh, the, the biggest takeaway with you talked about it coming in was just the optimism and how confident he is that he can get back to being showtime. And I asked about like being that heartbreaker guy when you were with the Chicago Blackhawks and you were fucking dominating. And, you know, obviously with hearing what other hockey players have been through and then ha- tr- coming back and really not able to return to the level of play in which they've had before. But then hearing that he had the same sh- surgeon as as uh, Andy Murray and who's been able to come back and p- compete to the level in which he's comp- And even one of the first tournaments after he came back from that hip surgery, I think it was might even been Wimbledon and he went all the way to the finals. And in, over the course of that, he had some, you know, five setters that lasted four hours. So... Because of his optimism and the way that he spoke on the broadcast, I'm going to believe that that they are getting a guy who can contribute to this, you know, right now a playoff team and potentially take him to that next level where, especially in the East, man, I feel like it's anybody's game right now. There, There isn't any team that steps ahead one way or another. And just as the Iser, Iser plan has been over the past couple of years, surrounding these younger players that are coming up, like the Siders, the Raymonds, and, and I mean, you can list a few more if you want, being around these guys who have not only won cups, but just provide that 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 veteran presence in order to teach them how to be pros. I mean, they brought in Oli Mata, cup champ with the Penguins. Uh, Perron, who I thought had a huge hand in helping them win in St. Louis, and he's still got tons of game left. Um, and then uh, bringing in JT Comfer. And I think that JT Comfer, like, you know, he, when they won the cup, he was a third line center. And then because last year they didn't have Kadri, they tried uh, New Hook in that situation. And then 
shortly thereafter, they didn't think that he was ready. And JT Confer spent a lot of time in that second line role. So bringing in these other guys to complement the young talent along with other Wiley vets, like I keep raving about the back end. I think that this team is definitely going to make playoffs now. I think that he's going to come and have an impact. And at 2.75 million, that's a fucking bargoon, man. And if he loves it and the connection is back there with the Brinkett, like it once was in, in with the Blackhawks, maybe he gets a few more years. They get a few more years out of him. And, and my last thing I'll say is I truly believe that like, because he is the is going to go down as the greatest American born player of all time. I think the idea of only playing for original six teams is probably maybe something that has an had an impact on his decision because beforehand it seemed like 3 days before it was either Florida or Dallas. Something something made him change his mind. Well, he said that he said that um he mentioned that Detroit throughout the entire process just kept popping into his mind. So that's like one thing, like, you know, say you're, you're looking to buy a house and you're looking at all these houses and then there's one house you've seen that you just can't get out of your mind. It's like your mind, it, it's not playing tricks on you. So I think he knew if I continue to think about Detroit, obviously I think that's where my heart wants to be. And also he said that he needed to be somewhere where hockey's super important and a big part of the, the city. And, and I think maybe, maybe now granted, I've been completely wrong on the Panthers. They look awesome. awesome. They look like a top three team in the East. And their me. crowds have been incredible. And too. their crowds have been better, yep. but it's still different in terms of like what it means to the fan base and what it means to the city. And so he kind of mentioned that that was part of it. So I, I think, do you feel like that plays into the original six aspect? It just well, it has he certainly this... is dominating the Jersey game. We talked oh. about it. the guy just is just three sick jerseys oh. in his career. Um, but like to bring it and what, what they had together. And he mentioned with you, like just the fact that like, they're not only like, have a good connection on the ice, but they became like best friends off the ice. So obviously everything kind of came to a head and made it very clear looking back, like everyone should have realized it was going to be Detroit. Just like when, when he ends up signing, it's like, ah, that was kind of more obvious than I thought. But I, I was kind of hesitant and still amped in a sense of like, man, the, the, the four hockey players who've had this have never been able to play again. And like, this guy's older. He's got so many miles on him. Like, I don't really know what to expect. Then he did his interview with you where he was very confident in saying like, I'm going to be a better player than last year. I think that was his quote. Like, and it's like, whoa, like now right away that took me aback. Like, holy shit. Like he wouldn't be saying this if he wasn't sure. I, I was talking about this on game notes with Murr and Armdog and then uh, the chat. Cause I don't know if you know, Army's kind of reading the chat sometimes on that show. He's into the chat. Oh yeah! A bunch of people immediately. A bunch of Capitals fans said Backstrom was saying the same thing. So then you start thinking, you know, you just want to say it about the the, the, it. the alleviation of pain instantly. He didn't say that, but he said like, "I'm I'm going to be better than I was before," kind of thing. Like, like and then the quickly came. thereafter, what it, it, like the, the 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 muscles around it just couldn't support. I what actually was going. don't know what happens in terms of like why like. Uh, we sh I should have called Jove or something to ask, like, what exactly happens in terms of, like, not being able to move the way you once could? So, obviously, there's, like, two sides to this, where Kane seems as confident as ever, and, and so Capitals fans saying, listen, we've kind of heard this before from someone that couldn't do it. But I, I think for him to say the pain went away the two days in, that was pretty, like, oh... Wow, that that's that's like when you hear people get a knee replacement, they're walking out of there like, oh my god, like thank God I did this. So uh, the the question remains to be answered in, in terms of how he's going to play. I I think it's very fair for Red Wings fans to give him a two week little runway, get get his legs underneath them, and you can't judge him right away. But just the fact that he said he was making plays without really putting weight on his right leg last year and still scoring, I think it was 0.7 points per game last season and six points in seven playoff games, even though Pasha will say they were all shitty points. I, I think my overall feeling now is that he's going to make an impact. I don't think he's going to be 100-point showtime baby anymore, but if he's still a legit top six player and that they have a straight-up no risk situation in Detroit. And I know I talked to people in Detroit that mentioned they talked to a lot of the people, the surgeon, the guy he's done the rehab with, and everyone's really confident that he'll be back and better than he was last year. So it's an Damn. exciting times for Wings fan, and they deserve it. Yeah. This team looks great. Wallman's doing the goddamn gritty. Well, that's what they made Kane do to pass his physical, the <laughs> gritty. No, I'm fucking, I'm not even kidding. But they made him do that to pass his physical. 
Yeah, he mentioned his crossovers are a lot better. Like he's able to do them with, like last year, he basically had to like almost like lift his leg, like put his hand just to fucking to move around out there with, with, before the surgery. Damn. Also, too, like what? How long would it, would an average like NHL does it take to get his win back? Like a guy who hasn't played for that long, like, like two weeks. I, three, well, I, I was think, just I gonna think, say too, though, is is. Uh, like obviously backstrom with being a centerman like it's it's a lot more skating and a lot of ice to cover i feel with with not only the way that kane plays which is like he's not out there throwing the body around and he can be up and down his wing it probably is is like he's a little better off than let's say jogo jovo who played a physical uh, game as a defenseman you're constantly going back for pucks and getting bumped and then of course in ryan kessler situation where he has to go out there and be a, be a maniac every night and haglin he specifically relies a lot on his speed as well, where I would say Kane, Kane, yes, he, he has a quickness about him, but I would say that what makes Kane special is where, because he beats you neurologically, like the way he that he's able, a lot because he, because he flosses a ton and he doesn't floss with the plastic pieces. He does it with the ones on his yep, fingers, yep. the old school version. Yep. Would you not uh, say he's got, he beats you neurologically from like, oh, a, like I beat a you with the hockey IQ in the mitts in the mitts in the mitts, in the mitts right? So, you know, not, not exactly the same type of game as some of these other guys. So coming back from the surgery. All right, going back to your question, mm -hmm. um, I think five to seven games is fair. Okay. In, in terms of just like after five to seven games, you're like, all right, the speed of the game, uh, my ability to kind of know what our system presents defensively and offensively and like everything all into one, some practices in between games, maybe playing a back-to-back. -back. So that's kind of when I feel like you'd feel a little better. Now, obviously, major injuries, a lot of people say it's like a full year. So mm -hmm. who knows how that'll go. People are talking about... Um, the opportunity for him to start his season tomorrow night or tonight, excuse me, if you're listening, uh, in Buffalo, his hometown. Woo. Personally, um, I think you wait until Thursday night when they're playing the San Jose Barracuda at home. <laughs> so let him let Just him make him his up. first appearance as a wing. In, in Little Caesars Arena, get the crowd going nuts. It's just an extra couple of days. Now, I'm sure the team wants him in as quick as they can as, as they can with how close the East is, but that's kind of where I would lean. Uh, but I think it, it, in the end, he'll come back. I'm looking, I, I can't wait to watch him, not just looking forward to it. And, and I hope that fans are a little patient at the beginning in terms of like, he's just getting his feet under him. Absolutely. You mentioned Detroit. They've been playing well. Newsy's got them firing lately. They're only one point out of second in the Atlantic so far. So, uh, hopefully they make a little challenge. Did for that you division. see that? Uh, yeah. Did you see the call the other night where he was snapping? I thought he was wrong for snapping. He was way wrong on that, dude. Uh, yeah, I don't know why was, was yeah. Detroit and the Rangers were playing. I think the game was on TNT. Actually, yeah, it was. It feels like it was a month ago. I mean, he's and reacting in real time too. I right? I, I love the fact that they could review that, and the player did grab his stick. And I mean, regardless of he thinks he lifted it up, it's like once you make contact, it changes the tra trajectory of it. Where he he shouldn't have he shouldn't have went and sat down. So that could be it but that would have been a double minor that could change the complexion yeah. of a game so more, i like to see more of that and less of the fucking offside review i yeah. i do i've been hard on the league and and the officials them bringing in the review high stick was awesome yeah because there's so many times it's your own teammate and it's just shit luck and that that's an awesome review to get that one right if you didn't get high stick by the opposing player and and also the ability to review that if it was a shot or a pass and the motion of the fall through got you that's no penalty that happened in Boston um, this past week I believe yeah. uh, I, don't, I don't remember who they were playing but it, it that that's a good review they added and since yeah, we yeah. already pumped uh, the Rangers tires and I don't think we have them in the outline we gave them a massive double wrister last week how about Trocheck leading Oof. the league in faceoff percentage he's scoring making plays playing physical that was that guy's a fucking gem man i can't believe carolina gave him away i feel like that's kind of that's like a component they might need a little carolina bit more thought he didn't skate well enough in their fast system and i think uh, i think well, he he's came got back that, from that broken leg i think he's got that bunting type grit where they need a little more of that a little more fu the way Dylan Cousins mentioned the Sabres need some FU in their game. Troach is a Troach is a rat out there. Oh yeah. So I know what you're saying, but he's done awesome. Um and and also Panarin is just MVPing his way through the first I've quarter of the year. Yeah, I've heard of him. All right, before I go any further, here's a few words from our friends at Game Time. Listen, folks, you shouldn't have to worry when you're buying tickets to your next big event. That's what game time is for. Game Time is the fast and easy way to buy tickets for all the sports, music, comedy, and theater events near you. It's winter time. There's lots of shows coming in, lots of games, Celtics, Bruins, whatever city you're in, basketball, hockey, all kinds of stuff going on. 
what you want to do. You want to browse through that game time app, talk about the upcoming events, see what's going on right now. I'm going to go wherever I can because it's so cheap, dude. You go on game time, boom, couple taps, 10 seconds. You get last minute deals, flash deals, zone deals. It's so easy to find and buy tickets for every kind of event in your area. Whatever you like, sports, concerts, all that good stuff. And game time is the only ticketing app that gives you complete peace of mind with your purchase. See the view from your seat before you buy so you know exactly what to expect when you arrive. All in prices show you total upfront so you know you're getting a great deal without hidden fees. Buy tickets, boom, in seconds with two taps. So take the guesswork out of buying tickets with Game Time. Download the Game Time app, create an account, use the code Chicklets for $20 off your first purchase. Terms apply again. Create an account and redeem code Chicklets for $20 off. Download Game Time today. Last minute tickets, lowest price, guaranteed. All right, boys, uh, second big story in the week uh, after an incident in Columbus and a subsequent investigation, the Blackhawks terminated Corey Perry's contract. Uh, a visibly upset uh, general manager, Kyle Davidson, gave a presser to uh, squash these absolutely fucking stupid rumors that originated on hockey Twitter or, or just and these idiots who glommed on uh, to hockey that they don't even pay attention because the salaciousness of, of something that didn't happen. Just people are total fucking assholes about it. Uh, I did think the Blackhawks probably could have got ahead of that a little bit earlier. Uh, it seemed like they kind of sat in their hands a little bit when you franchise the, the league's franchise player, you, you a new franchise player. This awful stuff is being said that uh, there's no relevance to it. It starts with a non credibility anonymous account and all these idiots gave credibility to it. Uh, he just felt awful. Then a media a member up in Winnipeg asked him about it. It was just an ugly, ugly time. Uh, Biz, I know you wanted to unload both barrels here on, on hockey Twitter in general. Just, just the, the fucking idiocy of it all. It's just, it's embarrassing. It's, and that's the only way I, I could fucking phrase it. Yeah. And like going back to last podcast, we didn't want to put too much gas on it because we didn't even want to acknowledge it. We just said, shut the fuck up with the rumors at the end. And <clears throat> once again, just like those idiot Rangers fans bitching about the, the trade for Kane is people, are th you know, they probably hadn't lis listened to the whole pod. We're saying that we were avoiding the topic. Well, one, we don't know what the fuck's going on. Like when it's involving guys personalized, we stay the fuck out. But we knew that wasn't the case. But the reason we didn't want to say exactly what it was is because we also didn't want to put any type of gas on it. Well, that was assuming, and, and keep in mind, like I call like older people that I trust to like consult on like the way that we should word things. And, and that's why we ended up wording it the way that we, well, at least the way that I did. I did so also assuming that the next couple of days after things would die down, but because people didn't get the answers that they wanted, they didn't get to hear what actually happened. They run with this online rumor and, and <clears throat> there's a lot of people out there online that were fucking tweeting this fucking nonsense. Like this, I just, I, I just feel that I was very let down with all these fucking idiots on Twitter. Now, m most of you would be like, well, what do you expect from these fucking idiots on there all the time? Just trying to stir it up and, I just wait, like I'll throw it over to you. I was fucking disgusted by what happened. And I think that with what this kid's already had to deal with coming in with all this fucking pressure on him and then getting going through that media circus early on and then to put the, the next star in the league through this type of shit, like you're not a hockey fan, in my opinion, if you're going on there slinging it like that. Like this is this guy's fucking personal life. So as far as the way that Connor Bedard handled it, and the way that his fucking family had to deal with this, like he handled it with ultra class and they've obviously raised a, a very, a very intelligent kid and, and a kid that, that couldn't have handled himself more appropriately during this fucking bullshit time that he had to deal with. Yeah. I think when he looked, um, at, at towards the season and what he'd have to deal with like this wasn't on the bingo card it's like what the hell is happening and that's why i did feel really bad for him now i'm a little bit of a hypocrite i gotta be honest maybe it's having played in the nhl and and just you know feeling for guys that that play in the nhl a little more so because i was there once like if this was an nba or nfl story i probably would have been laughing and i don't know if i would have been tweeting about it but it's like it just hit a little close to home, I think, for us. And I just felt as a younger rookie who's dealt with all this madness to have to deal with that. It's just not fair. And it's not fair to his mom and his dad. It's like it's just crazy what can happen online with people just tweeting out anything they want. And all of a sudden, something catches fire and there's no truth. And boom, it's gone. It's fire. It's 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 it's, it's everywhere. So the fact that that Winnipeg reporters like asking about it, that's wild to me. And Darren Pang mentioned on the Blackhawks broadcast that the Winnipeg owner, the Jets owner, actually went on the bus and apologized um, to Connor Bedard and the Blackhawks for that for that 
me- media, whoever it was, ask him about it. It's like, why why do you have to ask a kid about that when it's it's not true? It didn't happen. Like that should be a non-story for especially media members. Now I understand the internet. It's a horrible place. I I it, it it's entertaining. It's funny, and at times it's horrible. And so when that thing caught on, you know it wasn't going anywhere. A rumor like that is like. I mean, so many people were wondering, is this true? Is this true? That's how crazy it is that people just kind of believe what they read. Um, but it, it was just brutal for that kid to have to deal with that. Hopefully it goes away. But my entire thing on game notes and, and obviously the Blackhawks addressed that. But I was like, where are the Blackhawks? What what are you doing? Get out and say something. Even in Corey Perry's case, like get out and say something. Like now he he released a statement after the press conference that Davidson gave. But what an absolute clusterfuck of an entire story. Wait, like, you think? So- but like, I mean, they're trying to like investigate what's going on, and like you don't know what parties are involved and who's asking things to keep quiet. Like I can agree with you on it. I think they probably took about forty eight hours too long to cu- put a statement out to kind of put the fire out. But they might have also been thinking the same way I was. Where why why would we? put gas on this and acknowledge it and therefore like then all of a sudden more people are talking about it i know i think that that's when you try to i don't know i don't know how it's easy right now to say the way that we would have handled it but we don't know what the fuck's going on behind the scenes who wants their privacy what was actually even done and if like at the end of the day like do, I don't feel like I'm owed anything by here, to, to, like to know what the fuck happened. Like all the only thing I want is based on what finally Perry did come out with is I want this guy to go, you know, make sure him and his family are all right and him to go find peace in his life. What the fuck do I need to know about what the fuck happened behind the scenes? I, I, I understand what you're saying, but I also know the internet and I knew that thing wasn't going away, man. And I think the Blackhawks could have maybe. I don't know how. Maybe you go to somebody a, a little younger and a little more in tune with how the internet works. Like that thing was not going away. I think it was pretty clear that like they were hoping it did, and it wasn't. And then like TMZ's writing shit, and it's like, oh my god, this has gone completely out of control. And then they realize now, if I'm Bedard's family, I'm fucking fuming that they hadn't said anything early. Personally, that's me. It's like step up and say something. Now you're right. If it was. This this story is so wild because I was on Game Notes. I said, it's a tough way for a borderline Hall of Fame player like Corey Perry. And people are coming at me. Oh, you defended him. He's one of your buddies. What a we scumbag. Don't, we don't, we don't like, even know what the fuck happened. Like, yeah. We don't even know what he did. Okay? And I was on Game Notes saying, a really tough way for this guy's career to end. Well, now it's like, is his career going to be over? Because here's the thing. To, con- to terminate a contract, man, like that is a big deal within the players union. I think that's easy easy to say like you can't have a precedent sent where you can just terminate a contract we've seen contracts terminated for um um legal stuff um and who who am i thinking of that that dealt with that it's not we got time who take your time but Uh, start flossing more uh i know i gotta floss before the show now or we'll say say non-legal ones like um we had Brendan Le- Leipzig I think that was his name do you remember his private Instagram conversation was made yeah. public yeah and yeah the, the yeah. Capitals terminated his contract and then there was a guy Dotchin for uh, Tampa Bay his he didn't come to to camp in shape they terminated his contract so like that's non-legal stuff okay we've seen uh, Voyanov. His was his was terminated because of um, the s- domestic abuse domestic, charge. Yeah. So there, there's different ways that it can happen, but the PA as a whole does not want to see this stuff going down because it opens up this can of worms. So now we have Perry, who Davidson come out and said it was not a criminal case. Correct, all right? There was correct. no. Nope. So you're now wondering, all right? Well, if he wasn't on the Blackhawks, would they not have terminated his contract? He was mm-hmm. playing well. And obviously something happened, but the Blackhawks have, you know, the, the entire Kyle Beach case. So they're super sensitive in terms of like, we just have to be ahead of this and yeah. and, and, and we can't risk any sort of like, um, uh, what's the word? I can't try, talk Even about a, a parents of try to like cover some sort of misbehavior yes. up because yes. there's so stands on like, his way up here with, where maybe every other, every other team is maybe a little bit lower. A lo- so now a lot if no lower. criminal charges come and teams are doing their due diligence and find trying to find out what happened like maybe perry's career isn't over now first and foremost his his statement was that he needs to go get help and he's going to get help uh, mentally and for alcohol and i i wish him the best 
I don't know what he did, so obviously my opinion could change depending on if we ever find out what actually happened. But if he's able to go get the help he needs and then there's no criminal charge and teams do say maybe find out what happened or even don't, does he get signed? Because, dude, if you sign before March 8th, you could play in the playoffs. You're telling me if teams are going out and trying to find out what actually went down and Perry says, I'm doing better, I'm in a better place, there will be teams calling him and looking to grab him for a playoff run. And I just don't know where this thing plays out. There's so many questions that remain to be answered because we don't know anything. And I don't, I don't know if we ever will. And yeah, and, and like I said, I think it just comes down to like the fact that we don't know. You just hope that the guys are all right. Like even that story recently came out, like all the pressures of playing and uh, uh, Sam Gerard, like, you know, yep. he felt that he was masking whatever he was dealing with, with alcohol and he needed to go get help. Like there's a lot of stress and like everybody deals with shit guys. Right. And sometimes mm -hmm. certain people's have a way of handling it and it spirals out of control and, and that's life. And then keep in mind, you're talking about a job here where you can't exactly just go in your cubicle and and just hang out and do it. You got to fucking put your gear on, then do it in front of 18,000 people. And if you don't do it well, your fucking name's in the paper for playing like shit. So there's a lot. I, I hope, like I said, this, these guys go and, and find their peace. Everybody deserves it. And if I guess if the, the one little advice I'd give is you don't always need to be first to the fucking story and the rumors. Just let things yeah. play out the, 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 the way that they need to and, and fuck off with all the internet bullshit. Yeah, and I don't think and we're not talking about rumor boys where a guy might yeah. get traded. We're talking about guys' personal and family lives. Right, and biz. I don't think anyone was trying to win a story though. It, it was just somebody the dickhead and, and the the way the world. The way yeah, the but I'll say people, this already: there were yeah. certain accounts that like I would deem in the the media circle that were like putting gas on it too, where it's like you just avoid this, like don't don't fucking don't kick up dust. Like you just, you just, like we just talked about a Winnipeg Jets reporter asking Connor Bedard about it inside a fucking locker room. So obviously these got to places where it shouldn't have, and it's just ugly to see. And it's just like, if you had to point the finger at one thing, I'm not really looking to the way that Blackhawks management handled it. I'm looking to these fucking idiots online who put gas on it. True. Yeah. And, I do think if this was another team, right. And, 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 like this, I don't know if this would have happened if it wasn't the Chicago. There Blackhawks. you go. You're saying right. maybe that like they would have just kind of handled it internally, and then it would have kept. No, under I'm saying the rumors in terms of like, oh, but it's like the whole Bedard thing. Like he's such a big story. Like if Perry was on, um, I don't know, the Wild, and he got sent home and like kicked off the team on a, on a trip. Like I don't think all of a sudden it's like, oh, he slept with this dude's mom. Like it, it, it was like it was like a perfect storm of madness for the internet to just explode with stupidity. Yeah, when we when when he goes on to win the Calder and and plenty of league awards and and lights the league on fire for many many years, let's just remember how he was treated coming in and how he handled it. Yep, right, absolutely. That media circus to start where what what was it? National TV back to back nights. Go play in Montreal. Go play in Toronto. Go play Vegas, defending Cup champs. Go play Colorado, the fucking champs from two years ago. Now all of a sudden, this shit kid's got a lot on his fucking plate, boys, and he's handling yeah. like a G. Good. Good, well said, Biz. Let's have some fun. Let's talk about the regular yeah, traditional no, hockey stuff. Good, I mean, yeah, fuck, it's no, a, we need it to the talk about it. News but, in, in, uh, in the hockey world. No, absolutely. I just want to yeah move it along because it's it's uh, it sucks to have to talk about that yep. shit all the time. Uh, one team that did make a couple moves since uh, we last met, Biz, the Canucks. They uh, unloaded Anthony Beauvillier to Chicago for a fifth round pick in 2024. Obviously, Chicago trying to fill the gap uh, with now that uh, what's his name Perry's not there. They picked up Nikita Zadorov, the strapping defenseman from Calgary. His first game, 1735, he played. He got an assist, a plus two. I mean, they, they had him paired with uh, Tyler Myers. A little bit of a twin towers out there for Vancouver. Oh, I don't know if they like that being said. Didn't they, didn't they flag that down already? They don't like that nickname? Or is it too to... bad, so sad, we're calling them the Twin Towers? Wit, what uh, do you think? Oh, uh, God, I fucking... I mean... Those two came out and said, don't call us the Twin Towers? Somebody, some... It was floating around online that the, the name wasn't liked. Okay, I don't know if it's relative to... No, but, but Ari, you can say yeah. it. They, okay. Sidora's right, not going to come then. take your fucking head off now. <laughs> Fuck him. No pun intended. Yeah, man. I mean, this guy's fucking th making 3.75 bill on the contract. UFA. I think this guy's going to have a, a bunch of shooters line up after this season. Biz, he's a, a tremendously physical defenseman. His teammates love him. We had him on the show before. Probably the one of the funniest Russians we've had. But what what do you, what do does he bring to the Canucks? We already saw one game. How much does he uh, make this team better? And what do you expect uh, going forward with Zadorov on the Canucks here? 
I, I, it just makes him deeper, right? Mm -hmm. It's just one of those things where you know as a forward when you're getting on the ice or you better know that Zadorov's on the ice, okay? You've seen some of the hits he's thrown. He got all up in my ass when I said he wasn't that good of a skater. He immediately sent G a little screenshot of him being uh, uh, one of the fastest playing skaters at a certain moment in time this season. Uh, you know, as everyone knows, they're tracking every guy's speed throughout the game. He said, why don't you tell Wit to watch worked, his fucking you mouth? Figure it out. What? If the app worked, you could figure it out. Yeah, exactly. Um, so I just think that when you have a guy that's that physical, that is that good at kind of moving the puck when he wants to be. Now, the only question is, when you talk to Flames fans, and Biz said this last episode, he'll be playing this perfect game, and then all of a sudden there's like a Off Whitney turnover that you're like, whoa, whoa. Now, I think talk, and more more importantly, probably Adam Foote will be able to sit there and just talk about simplifying his game. I mean, was there was there many better defensemen in the history of the league at just being shut down pricks to play Oof. against, n really minimize the mistakes like Adam Foote? I mean, that, that's the perfect type of guy that should be coaching Zadorov, right? Like, you, you want to play like Adam Foote, we got a chance at going on a big run this year. So an awesome move. Lucky enough for the Canucks, um, they were able to take on the salary. That was the problem. Biz almost had one of the greatest calls of all time saying the Leafs were going to grab Zadorov and Tanev. Turns out Elliot Friedman confirmed that, that the Leafs were trying to get both of them. Tree Living was trying to get his two boys, but they needed they needed Calgary to retain salary. They were not interested in that. And speaking and of internet rumors, like I just completely made that up. I didn't talk to anyone behind the scenes. I just had a hunch that they were going to go for them. So back okay. to you. I, I pumped your tires. I pumped your tires. Lost. And and so all of a sudden, all right, hey, we could take his whole salary on. We got Bolivier out, which made sense because Chicago's then looking for a veteran. So they grab him. Vancouver moves that money, brings in this big D-man. And now it's like, whew, we got, to, we got a breath of fresh air in this Canucks room because it's not only about him on the ice, taking up so much space, being a better skater than I gave, gave him credit for, having a cannon of a shot. Well, he's also a personality. Right. He's a guy in the room that's loud. He's talking. He's chirping guys. Very well dressed. I think he was very adamant to us about how uh, into maybe his fashion he is. So, so <laughs> excuse me. <laughs> I got a floss. But just one of those guys that just makes an impact right off the right off the bat. I thought he scored the empty netter, but I guess it was tipped when he shot it down the yeah, ice. He didn't want to go full Ryan Smith. Pete, get a piece. Yeah, we give yeah. it a couple games. <laughs> Cookie Monster. Uh. Well, if it, it if it tells us anything, when it tells us that it looks like Vancouver is pushing the chips in the middle here, like they this guy's got this year left on his contract, and then he becomes a free agent, right? And now, I mean, if you're looking from a Western Conference perspective, we've talked about the back ends. I would say the top two right now are are Vegas when healthy, and then Colorado when everybody's in the lineup. I would probably give slight edge for top end talent to Colorado. I love the way that Gerard moves around, but either way, both proven Stanley Cup champions that have a great back end. But you look now, Quinn Hughes and Roenick. Roenick's been playing unbelievable. He's basically like his Devon Taves right now. And then you got the Twin Towers, don't say that. Uh, Myers, Zadorov, and then when that Sosi is, is healthy, the way that he was playing, and then along with Ian Cole, Buddy, we both know once playoffs comes around, it turns on to, to, to you know medieval times dinner and Game tournament. Game of Thrones. Game of Thrones, buddy. You got, look at Florida and how they were able to get there. Good goaltending. You got Gem Demko. And then you got a couple stud puck movers. And then boom, you just a bunch of mutants like your Gudis, your Mark Stalls, and guys who can get the puck out of the zone and then close on guys in the defensive zone and then fucking shovel the thing out. So I think, I said like right now, if, I think they're one move away, one piece away from adding themselves to the a Colorado conversation, uh, a, a Vegas situation, uh, and a Dallas situation. No, what kind am, of piece am, am is I, that? Is what do you, like? What is the piece that they need? Do you think? So I so Kuz, Kuzmenko was a point per game player last year, and he was unbelievable. Obviously, stumbled out of the gates. I don't know if he's the type of guy who can get you a point per game, but also understand situational awareness and how to play the game the right way. Am I crazy with, is it sometimes hard to teach these younger Russian guys as to like, Hey man, you, you, you know, we're up a goal here. You don't look for your cookie. You just make the safe play, put a height behind the D man, force them and keep and eat the puck below the goal line. Like little situational things that we're talking about that you need to know throughout the course of a game. Also, it's like, all right, yeah, you, you got us a goal, but you were, 
in the middle of costing us two. It's it, it it's like I I understand that when you're scoring, you might think everything's going great, and I'm I'm just guessing at what talk it might be saying. Well, you're, like, there's we a reason you, you sit to be out defensively responsible. We need you to understand like. There's times we don't need a goal. So, yeah, you're saying it correct. I, I, since he's got back in the lineup, it's I think good. he's looked better. Looked better, right? But but ultimately, is, is you're trying to get this player to buy into the system that you're trying to get everybody else playing, in which they are, and they're winning games. And then I know we've been pumping Vancouver's tires quite a bit, and they've been the focal point of conversation on this podcast, but it's even their bottom six forward group. I fucking love this Lafferty. Talk about a whoopsie-daisy for the Leafs not signing this guy. Uh, I love that Joshua, like watching games, like there's times that he'll take over shifts as well. I, I like Bluger. He came over from Pittsburgh. Was he not a cup champ with the with the Pittsburgh Penguins? Was he there when they won? Or, or am I thinking maybe a little bit after? But don't mind him as a third line center. But that's maybe where you can try to go out and get help. Connor Garland, too. Think, he's been playing well. Sorry, Connor I Garland, to cut you off, I mean, he, you know? he hasn't scored as much as those other guys. I mean, like Hoglander and, and these types of players. But overall... Bottom six ain't their weakness. Are they of of maybe uh, L.A. Kings caliber bottom six? No. Maybe Vegas? Maybe not. But like I said, they're one piece away from being, hey, man, everybody's getting thrown on the fire first round. All of a sudden, if you get an upset or two, it's any man's game. So I, I like what they've done. It shows me that they're probably going to try to do something close to the deadline. And you know what the way that Aklini rolls, he's trying to push all of his chips in the middle too. He wants a fucking winner. He wants to go on a deep run. And that city's excited early on that they got something, something going. It might even be before the deadline because if you remember Rutherford in all his years in the NHL, he tries to add sooner. He wants, pay now he wants or pay more later. time with the guys. Right. And like if I can get this guy a month before the deadline, it's just another month with the team. So they probably try to get something done even sooner. I, I, I like their team. Um, I, I, I have a tough time putting them in the Vegas, Colorado, Dallas sphere yet, but. Good See move by them. Bring I in think the door. I think so, it's it's setting up the potential move that they could get to there. That's it. They're one, to me, they're one nice piece away. They got, I think, two and a half million dollars worth of cap space. The flip side, I think some people maybe from the Calgary component were a little frustrated at the lack of return. I think it ends up being a fair deal. And the fact that I don't think that things were were of, uh, of uh, you know sunshines and rainbows with him in the locker room, given you know comments he'd made through the media, and maybe not being happy since Daryl left. So to get off of that, to get rid of it, and fuck, Calgary's been playing some decent hockey too. So I'd say a pretty fair return overall, given the circumstances. And Ra, I don't know if you played uh, any any more cleanup on that. I, I think there's nothing more inevitable than in about a month, maybe two, Biz declaring himself a diehard. Vancouver Canucks fan. I'm That's going to be your way. He is. Oh, no, no. I'm he already. Signed it twice. Like, I'm going to. Okay. So let's put it this way. Like right now, the Toronto Maple Leafs are like my family in Toronto, maybe like a suburb, like in a Whitby. And I'm flying cross country on fake business to to fuck this dirt ball behind <laughs> my old lady's back, and that's the Vancouver Canucks. Yeah. So I'm being completely with, with, and the Coyotes are what your in laws is like. What do they come in? <laughs> the, like, like I think that my that that Ottawa was, my, was him banging his cousin. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right now the coyotes are like Until his sister you know, I, I i had a couple kids with my ex and mm -hmm. we're still amicable and you know i still have visitation right and, and we're good yeah, right? we're good. looking hot lately though biz i'll tell you that she, the, that's what i'm saying she's looking get again so like i might if i get busted crushing vancouver on my toronto wife then maybe i'll just end up calling it off and going down and getting back with my ex in arizona we'll see Jesus and then you Christ. know the cousin's always there at Thanksgiving and Christmas, yeah, and, and you know off to, you sneak, sneak away after the stuffing to, to yeah, do a little more stuffing walk, yeah. and uh, get the old turkey baster out. And next thing you know, <laughs> I thought you were talking about one minus the cousins get stoned. Biz, uh, shit, quick, quickly on the west, <laughs> um, your ass was in the jackpot with your um, side, side, side piece, the L.A. Kings Ooh. coming at their fourth line, buddy. The LA yes. Kings fans were letting you know their oh, fourth line is outplaying oh, everyone's fourth line. That's right. And I misspoke. And when we were talking and sometimes we're snapping around, it's, you know, locker room talk, spitting chocolates, man. I said that in a series, I'm obviously entrusting in Vegas Golden Knights bottom six, specifically their fourth line, in which they proved to us last year. But from a statistics standpoint, LA's fourth line's been incredible. So my my apologies to all you Kings fans who are roasting me online. 
uh, and dis- you know you, you were you were disgusted with my comments. And one other guy I did put in um, in the outline already since we're on the LA mm-hmm. talk was yeah. Travis Moore and Trevor what Moore. he's done since Trevor. Uh, Trevor Moore. Jesus fucking Christ. No, I'm really fumble fucking. All right, do you want to read those numbers for the people at home? Biz, I do have those numbers right here for Trevor Moore. Uh, After the injury last season, he had uh, 13 points in 38 games. It comes out to a uh, 28-point pace over a full season. Uh, This season, uh, he had 20 points in 21 games with a plus 7. It comes out to just under a point per game. Uh, Kings are getting tremendous uh, bang for the buck from him so far. This is his first year. It'll be a five-year, $21 million deal, $4.2 million, and they've already gotten almost a point per game out of him. That's tremendous. This production right there like the, the moves the moves that rob blake has made in order to you know i know getting rid of aya fallow and, and i'm drawing a blank on the other kid over over to the jets to get dubois gallardi velardi 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 but but travis having, moore and and gaby uh yeah, yeah. <laughs> the king bailey's gonna be fucking coming after us now spiking our punch taking away our flaws um but Having the foresight to see what Trevor Moore is going to be able to do and, and accomplish in that top six role, as well as with the steps that Byfield has taken to get off of that and then coming in and addressing a need that, I mean, I guess if depth at center ice, I mean, you can never have too much of that. So the moves that Rob Blake has continued to make and then solidifying the bottom six as well with Trevor Lewis won a cup there before. And uh, Akaliev and, and, and Dolan. I mean, it depends who's in and out, but regardless, just an excellent job. And that Kings team right now, I would say that if I had to bet on one team and all of my savings, I would probably pull it all in on the LA right now, the way that they look. one baby. I got Ooh, some fucking go on them. Ooh, How many futures that. do you have, though? Because you always uh, like... Yeah. I know I do. I know you seven have to pick teams, on me every year. No, I got right probably now? about... Well, actually, maybe. Yeah, but it could be that. I have to sit down and write them all down, but I definitely have Vancouver. I definitely have LA. So LA 37 to 1, Vancouver. I think I got a 50 to 1. Either way, how about Seth Rogen dropping the puck between uh, Ovechkin and Anze Kopitar, too? (laughs) With his fucking goofy laugh there. All right, before we go any further, here's a few words from our friends at Lightbox Jewelry Lightbox Lab Grown Diamonds, grown in Portland, gifted by you. Explore all the reasons to give and receive lab-grown diamonds this season. Is this the best-kept secret in holiday gift-giving? Stunning stones, simply priced. Gee, I know you've been in the market lately. What, uh, what you take on these things? You gonna be uh, jumping on board or what? Well, I'll tell you what, Ra. I after that last com- after that last podcast, the talk of engagement in talk of engagement rings. It's on the table now. We're having those talks, and the first place we start looking, light box jewelry it's just a no-brainer absolutely light box lab grown diamonds are simply priced and proudly grown from 100 percent renewable wind energy at the light box lab in portland oregon are you after a good deal but don't know where to start light box makes it easy fixed prices mean the days of negotiating the jewelry store with uncertainty are gone risk-free shipping and easy returns make light box the easiest way to shop for stunning quality lab grown diamond jewelry All of Lightbox's modern classics shine solo or can be layered for high-impact sparkle. And Lightbox also offers loose-grown diamonds for you to use in your own dream design. Get 10% off your order with code SPITTINCHICKLETS at lightboxjewelry.com. Uh, another quick note, too, uh, with Vancouver. Uh, Brock Bessa, uh, he scored two goals on Hockey Fights Camp tonight, the night it was in Vancouver. Of course, he lost his dad a couple of years ago. So, you know, obviously a, a sad story from a couple of years back, but it was nice to, little, you know, bittersweet type thing for him that, to score two goals on that night. But how about Tortorella, dude? Torts takes. What whole, a like, quote. Unbelievable. Uh, first off, we got to talk about the, the uh, Garnet Hathaway absolutely bundling Luke Hughes. And, and hand up, uh, I fucked up when I tweeted. I thought it was ja- Jack Hughes that he hit. And I says, I, I, do, I didn't say it wasn't a clean hit. I never said it was a dirty hit. But wait, if that if that was Jack, yeah, you would want one of your teammates to jump in and just start throwing shots if it was your captain. Granted, it wasn't. It was his younger brother. Not to minimize it, but uh, it was he a clean the hit. captain, though, R.A. I, I know, and I fucked up twice. <laughs> I know, it was a double fuck up. Point being is that if, if a guy of that caliber, whether Jack was the C or not, you you got to jump in, and, but I never called it a dirty hit. Hathaway pummeled in, and he got thrown out of the game. With just a bad call to throw a guy out of the game on that fucking call, right? All right, I'm gonna give you an opinion. Um, when somebody gets hit like that, whether it's a fourth line guy who plays three minutes, or who you thought was captain, who it actually wasn't, Jack Hughes, there should be an immediate jump in from everyone. 
And yes, we saw the Mark Stone hit by the LA Kings uh, player prospect in, in the preseason. He is the captain. And I think with a team like Vegas, it doesn't matter. Anyone gets run over like that, you got to get in there. That wasn't the story, though. The story was that that was a brutal call. It was a complete mess up by the, the linesman to not blow the whistle sooner. So obviously, Luke Hughes is expecting an icing call. The whistle goes so late that Hathaway doesn't know. The hit was as clean as you could ever make a hit. It was a perfect hit. It wasn't a headshot. Hughes touched the puck, and he got ran over. So it was more on the officials, I think, because they, they, you, you just got to be more clear. You got to be screaming icing, and maybe he was doing that, but the whistle wasn't blown quick enough. Hathaway never should have been kicked out of that game. He never really should have been even given a penalty, but the whole thing that Torts was talking about is the ability to hit, to take a hit and how players don't really possess that anymore. They, they, they don't worry about protecting themselves. Hitting's so different, it's not nearly as prevalent, but they're still hitting. It's a hitting league. That's Torts' thing. We're getting away from the physicality in this league, which is what makes it so special. So for him to say that, I think it makes a lot of sense. And I ha I've had coaches in my career, college and pro, actually talk to me about how to take a hit as a defenseman you're going back to get a puck you got to get it d to d well if you're going to get run over there's the you have the chance to kind of i know this sounds crazy it's probably hard to explain but if you can just honestly jump up a little bit and have the boards take the take the hit you know i, I don't know if i'm making sense biz you know what i mean no it's yeah because well because most most of the glass now it'll bend with you like yes. you're going, you're going old school. You're playing in some of these old barns. Like it's, you don't want to do that because you'll end up with a fucking tor, tor, you know, AC joint separation. Where yeah, in the NHL, you're trying to absorb it as much as possible, or at least with come up a little bit, not maybe come off your feet, but just kind of come up to absorb it. Yeah, just learning how to take a hit. It's it's a skill, and and that's what Torx is Torx is saying that like there's a lot of these hits that people are going nuts about the hit, and it's a dirty hit. It should be a penalty. Should be a um, a major get him out of the game. It's oh, like oh god. Well, half the that's time that's all that like, happens. Half Online. the time, like these guys, some of these younger kids, and and maybe maybe it all stems back to hitting starts so much later now for kids. And they're not hitting until they're 13 years old, 12, 13, 14 years old. Whereas when there was hitting earlier, now that's a, that's a totally different argument. Like, is it better to have these kids um, working Well, let on me their ask skills? you this. Who are the best drivers on the planet? Drivers? Men? Yeah. people? Yeah, like, no, oh, Jesus Christ. <laughs> like NASCAR, F1. When do you think they started doing it? With fucking go karts when they were fucking two, three years old, right? Like, I get that they don't, they're, they're not of age to drive. But fucking put bubble wrap on them and all of a sudden they're 13. Well, guess what? They're a lot faster. They're a lot more dangerous out there doing it. And they have no clue what they're doing. I went to a hockey, uh, a, a contact school in my hometown while it was in Port Colburn down the road. Neil Blanchard used to run it with all the other coaches who were, you know, going to be the teams where you're playing contact. And you'd spend a full week on just doing drills and learning how to receive and give hits. So it was a full week course before you took the season on. Well, yeah, I get we weren't fucking working on our toe drags and all the other bullshit in which kids work on skill wise. Why should, why, you know, why the onus doesn't seem to be on the player with the puck anymore at all. And that's being taught at a younger level. So why would the expectation change when they get to the NHL level? Well, half the guys in the NHL played a different way where we did have contact at a younger age. Like, I think that right now, like you said, it's 13 years old where, man, like, I think that like nine, 10 years old, it's fine. But Buddy, spend travel just as hockey, when I was growing up, town hockey, it wasn't. But travel hockey was hitting from the time you started playing mites. So so that that's the argument where where, where like I, I see what they did, because next year, Ryder will be playing like real hockey. He'll be he'll, he'll be a mite now. Back in the day when I was playing, that would have I didn't start playing travel hockey till fifth grade, but it was hitting right away. But next year, if there was hitting for him, which it was back then, like he's 38 pounds. I, he he would be getting murdered. So I see what yeah, they're but, doing. But 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 Woody or would they just be like out there like skating like they got, you know, chopsticks for legs and then they'd bump into each other and fall down? Like do do they can they really well, generate the, the speed the, uh, to get so smoked? Not like, like a 13 year old. Late He's a he's November twenty eighth seventeen. So like, if you're playing against a, a January fifth kid who's fifty seven pounds, like I I see what they're doing in waiting, but by waiting, you're getting kids 
never worried about taking a hit and you're getting kids to cut through the middle with their head down knowing no one's going to touch me and as you get older to wait until 12 13 14 then all of a sudden you're still dealing with size differences based on when kids hit puberty and not but all of a sudden you're thrown into the den like where i know what you're saying like if you get to learn at a really younger age when the hits won't be that big then obviously later on you're learning how to take one. But to not know how to take a hit, as Torts is talking about, that is that is that is a lack of a skill in the game because there 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 is physicality and the playoffs come and Game of Thrones style. It's like if you're not protecting yourself and you get injured by a hit, whether it's dirty or not, like you could have helped yourself out by knowing what's going on and having your head on a swivel and always realizing like I'm in a position right now to get run over where I, I just don't think guys even think about it. Yeah. Like, for instance, like even just coming up the wall, let's say. Like, sometimes you see some of the younger players where they'll leave such a gap, which if they do get hit, yeah. it could be messy with when they fall on the wall, where I know when I was coming up, it, you stayed a little bit tighter to the wall because once you get hit, you absorb it there. It's just like, there could be like, 10 to, to 20 different little tidbits of these types of things as far as angling that you could work on in a hockey school to prepare yourself for this type of thing. So I don't know what the answer is with. I definitely think that at five or six, and I don't, is a little too young where maybe like, you know, probably like nine, 10 seems a little yeah. bit more normal. And then also developing programs where they learn year over year going into it to, to, to prepare themselves for it. And what was the other thing I was going to- And uh, I don't want anyone to think like, Luke Hughes thought it was icing. It was icing. So th th it's a little unfair to be all, because he's just thinking, oh, like uh, icing. Like I'm, I'm more kind of calling out the refs, but I think Torts wasn't even necessarily talking about Luke Hughes. He's talking about the league as a whole. Like you got to realize when you're in a position to get run over, you got to protect yourself, whether it's getting your stick up, which may end up being a major and a suspension in itself. Well, at least you didn't get murdered through the board. So it's one thing to uh, know when who's on the ice and who you have to be aware of. And it's another thing to just be skating around head down, not worried at all. And not a lot of people down. say that was kind of Eric Lindros's problem is that he was so big and powerful and strong that in junior he was able to get used to playing with his head down because even getting run at by guys they bounced right off him and then all of a sudden he starts running into monster defensemen in the nhl in the in the mid to late late 90s and it's like these guys are not bouncing off you so it's just learning to play with your head up and protecting yourself while also being able to make plays while doing it Biz, I know you learned at a young age, but do you think young NHL guys would be receptive right now to someone coming in and trying to teach them this? No, no I think that at that level, you should just be smart enough to understand. And if you if you don't, I mean, probably a, a, a couple of meetings with some older teammates to understand body position. I don't think that there's I don't think there's anyone in the NHL who's playing that you couldn't maybe explain this to and then them figure it out in a couple of weeks. I think this is what Adam Oates does a lot. Oh, and b by the way, I, um, that reminded me. We were talking about the Jets last week and their success, and, and I mentioned Morrissey and his offensive just like – masterclass these past few years and somebody dm me that he started working with adam oats before last season so i know oats has talked a lot about like changing guys uh ways they think about the game and little plays here and there and protecting yourself well he's also just done so much with morrissey's offensive game so i thought that was interesting and if you talk about a guy who's preparing his players to not get ran through the middle, yep. it's, you know, where That's can part you expose, yeah, where can you expose the ice and then stay out of most danger as far as punishment you're taking? So there's resources available, but there's a, it's a, it's a long, deep discussion, but I'm glad that Torts brought it up. And he also had another money quote. Uh, gee, yeah, roll that. We win the game because we've got balls. Yeah. We do. We, we do stupid stuff. We don't make some plays sometimes. Um, lose sight of certain momentums in the games uh, a number of things we have to work on and try to get consistent at but one thing we do have is balls i mean this guy's a fucking quote machine and he's completely changed the identity of that team this year and, and i agree with him sometimes they make mistakes they're not the most skilled squad i mean fuck guys their best defenseman coming the year was sandheim and look what they what they've been able to accomplish. And credit to him because he's had an awesome monster season so far, especially offensively. Where I, I heard rumblings that they were trying to trade him in the off season. Yeah, so, Corey Krug said no, or he was gone, and he okay. was a blue. Interesting. You got the whole the whole uh, rumor boy wrap up there. Ooh. Um. The the I still I still think that if you talk to most Flyers fans, I don't know if this is like what they need this year. And and that's that's. As you're as you're in the playoffs right now, and or maybe they might be one point out or of the wild card, but it's like 
I don't know, man. Like, I think Briere went there and Jonesy's there in terms of, like, really being good when, when Mitchkov can come over in three years and, like, being ready to go then and maybe some more high draft picks. Is this going to end up hurting them if they barely miss the playoffs? It's like, it's the age-old question we've talked about on this show. If you're going to be bad, be real bad. Jonesy seems adamant that the, he, I think he had a quote that said tanking is that word is not in the Philadelphia Flyers vocabulary. So I, I don't think they're going to go down that road. And it sounds like they're actually looking to buy at the deadline. No to keep going. fucking way. I don't oh. believe it. Well, I they're going to trade that it. Walker. The experience is great for these guys, at least. I mean, 12, uh, 12, 10 and two with 26 points. They are tied with uh, Washington right now. Uh, for the, Well, not for the wild card, too. They are a, a one game in hand more than them. But just going back to uh, the uh, Adam Oates stuff, you know who started working for Adam Oates recently? I'm not sure, sure if you heard, Biz. A kid named Ty Gretzky. <laughs> no shit, eh? They're yeah. working together now? Yeah, oh, wow. Yeah. Well, he is yeah. in Florida. Oh, he told well, me that. Yeah. No, I talked. I texted I text with Ty on the reg. Yeah, he, he said he was like doing some... On I kind of got to... Obviously got to a chuckle out of that, that he, Mr. Gretzky was working for Mr. Uh, Oates. I mean. Going back to your other <laughs> comment about um, Luke Hughes, the hit. Do Like, you lack a response. We you, talked about it while you were standing up, actually. Oh, I was hosing? Yeah. Well, okay, so. I, I know that's why I was bringing it back up. You were pissed off that they didn't fight? Uh, well, R.A. was the one that mentioned it when he said that they hit their captain, Jack Hughes. It wasn't Jack Hughes, and he's <laughs> not the captain, but he addressed that already. And I said it wasn't even about that It that if it was Jack Hughes, if it's anyone gets hit like that, right. anyone on the roster, you should have everyone getting in there. I think Siegenthal or like tried to do something, but it's like... Uh, the next guy in was McLeod. McLeod should have jumped over the top and just drilled Hathaway. Now, the other side of the thing is, I think everyone saw what Cousins, what happened to Cousins when he went up to Hathaway. So yeah, it's like, Hathaway it. ain't exactly the type of guy you want to fuck with. But if no. one of your teammates gets run over, clean hit or not. Well, that was actually, didn't Torts also bring up, like, when it's a clean hit, now there's a fight? I... I We've talked about this. Like, I don't really care if it's a clean hit. If a guy gets completely run right. over, get yeah. in there. Yeah, who Torch, Torch disagrees with that. Torch, Torch is saying clean hit shouldn't be anything. I'm kind of a, un, under the thing of like, all right, you throw a great hit. The team of uh, uh, the the teammates of the guy who threw the big hit are fired up, but the team uh, of the player who got run over, they should just get in there. Yeah, it could be clean, but it could be a fucking nice, yeah. fucking nasty hit puts a guy out. Yeah, I mean, it's a natural reaction to fucking defend your teammate. Uh, also, too, in that same game, Luke got the last laugh with the o overtime game. What a nice pass from Jack. Gave a little little, little bow, a little salute there at the end. That was cocky. pretty funny get, stuff. Getting the cocky sellies going. Get the yeah, gritty, gotta love it. At the bow. Uh, uh, and another jersey note to uh, Dougie's going to be out for a little bit. He had a torn pec, had to get surgery. They brought up uh, Simon Nemich, uh, the highly regarded prospect. He had two assists in his first game on three shots on goal. 22-38. He played with uh, one of those assists was a power play assist. So uh, people so don't that's think that's a chance for him to come up right now. Say Hamilton's gone for two months. I mean, torn pec. I, I got to think that's yeah. at least a month and a half. Easily. And all of a sudden, this kid gets in. And when Hamilton comes back, well, you ain't going back to the minors, bud. You're here to stay. So it's like his ice time would decrease. But all of a sudden, now we got a l nice puck mover and a strong prospect, a young player that we were able to kind of unfortunately bring up. You know, we weren't hoping he came up because of an injury, but he's up now and he's ready to go. So that's that could be a great thing for them. They lost to San Jose six to three, though. So yeah, that that too. But uh, Silver Line, I believe they call it. What you know, you you lose a guy like Dougie, Silver but Line, the Silver, Silver Line, Line playbook, Nemich. great movie. Uh, oh, well, there you go. Jennifer Lawrence nah. is top notch in my Gets book. Me Smoke going. Show. Silver Line playbook is not a great movie. Not a great. Oh, movie, sorry, but, uh, R.A. Well, another argument for another day. Uh, Dean Everson and Billy Guerin, obviously, they had a great relationship. Uh, Billy had a fire, but there was a, a tremendous article. Uh, our friend Mike Russo had in the athletic. And uh, he, uh, Everson was summoned to Guerin's office. He walked in, and, and Dean just looked at him and said, You fired me, bud. And Guerin said, Yeah. And he, and he hugged him, oh. and they just both started like having an, a, an emotional moment. And, and it was such a great read. Like, Dean was like, not like lamenting and all, oh, my God, what was me? He said, Hey, man, this has been the best. I, I came to Minnesota, I got a pop, and he used to walk to work every day. Like, the whole neighborhood knew him. He was just such a, a great guy. And I know we've talked about his demeanor and the and the on the bench. He he's kind of like looks grumpy, but he's actually a, a very well liked guy, a players coach. And he says, Don't cry for me, Argentina type stuff. Uh, my wife, she 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 uh, flies the long haul flights to uh, Europe. He says, I'm gonna go see a couple nice cities in Europe and uh hopefully get a, a new job soon. So if you haven't seen it, wait, I don't know if you read it. Awesome piece I of did the read it. Um, yeah. I thought it was a great read. 
Um, and and I, I was interested. He somebody asked John Hines when he got hired when Minnesota really started struggling. Did you start watching their games, thinking, hey, if they make a coaching change, maybe I'm a guy I'd like to see the team play. And and Evanson mentions in the article that's maybe something he would start doing if he sees a team really struggling, start watching them. Maybe maybe I get that job. So they did some great things. It's actually an awesome read. R R A said it. Go check it out. He kind of talks about. Has he like, been watching the Senators? <laughs> <laughs> he might start. Dude, yeah, well, he might Wood, start. Jay buddy. Woodcroft. Jay Woodcroft's name's getting uh, mentioned with the Sens too. Uh, biz. I know. I heard that. I don't know if that's rumor, boys, or or is that legit? Like, well, imagine what's that crazy quick. about the Sens. So they when, when did they come in the league already? Like ninety ish, ninety ninety one. I want to say ninety one, ninety two is their so first. So thir- 30, 33 years they've been around, and DJ Smith's the second longest tenured coach they've ever had. Holy fuck! That's, that's who. And wild. they've been Bones. trash every year. Like, well, yeah, pretty much. Twenty seventeen, pretty much, they had man. Two, well, two thousand seven, they lost the cup. Twenty seventeen, no, I'm they talking had... about since DJ Smith's been there. Oh, okay. I, I'm. I, they make Brady Kachuk's never played a playoff game. Like, That's I, wild. I, I, I feel bad. Like I, I, I. It is bad. I, what are they waiting for? In a sense, like they, they, they're, they're, they're. It's happening again. They're playing themselves out of the playoffs by Christmas. They look brutal. But they're showing fight, and I think that's what the, the own, new owners mentioned is like, there's no give up here, and but they're not winning. They had a so, huge win against Seattle. It was one nothing. They just oh, held yeah. on to it. Yeah, no, it was a it was a pretty good game back and forth. Seattle's a little bit mid to Seattle watch. Stinks. Oh god, there's so much perimeter action. It's there's not a lot of good going on there. I think they're going to take a dump this season. But uh, as far as Ottawa's concerned, the the statement from Steos was. There's been constant movement throughout the organization, whether it's ownership and, you know, Dorian leaving, where they want to create stability for the players. It seems as if though all the players really like DJ Smith, so maybe his leash and rope is going to be a lot longer, like even to the point where if this continues and they're not a playoff team, he might even get to the end of the year where they'll just do it in the offseason. But man, with expectations coming in the way they've been and the way that the fan base is barking and and if you watch some games, like, yeah, there are some holes to their games, but in the same breath, they have dealt with injuries and had to have some pretty good, impactful players out of the lineup, but so is every fucking team. So I don't know where, I don't know how much longer this leash is if, if it stays the way it's been for another 15 games. At a certain point, though, you got to try to make a stab for playoffs, and and if there is an p- opportunity to do it, I think that they got to pull the trigger. Like I think that Woodcroft d- deserved to keep his job more so than than probably DJ Smith to this point. No. Yeah, and and, and Biz Ottawa, they're eighteen points is last in the East, but you know we hear about DJ Smith a bunch, but Buffalo, uh, they're only four points ahead of Ottawa, and they've played six more games, and we don't hear Don Granado's name as much, and I'm not saying that that we need to, but I, I mean, who's more in a hot seat here? Is it Granado or, or Smith? Even though we've heard about Smith more, I mean, Buffalo is a team that people thought we're going to get in the playoffs, and and they're on pace to have fewer f- points than Ottawa right now. So, yeah, so I would say those types of early conversations have started much like they did maybe last year for DJ Smith. So if I had to put a, a, a running list right now, I would say I would have said before that um, the the Carolina Islanders game, I would have threw Lane Lambert's in the mix, like to the point where Lou is – Lou can make some wild decisions. All of a sudden, next thing you know, he's behind the bench. You know how Lou likes to operate. He ain't, he ain't afraid to pull the trigger. Where I would have put Lane Lambert, number one hot seat, DJ Smith, based on Steos' comments, probably number two. And then right behind that, I think I would probably have to put uh, Granado in, in Buffalo. And But once again, I think that he gets till the end of the season. But at a certain point, you have to start seeing some form of growth. And this long playoff drought, the longest, is this the le- longest playoff drought in NHL history in which they got going right now? 11 seasons? I, the longest current. I know that. I don't, I don't think, I don't believe it's pro sports. They're tied with the New yeah. York Jets. Pro longest sports. Current. Yeah. So, I mean, come on here. So that would be my running list. Whit, do you have any, do you, do you disagree with any of that? No, not really. Um, the whole three goalie thing has been kind of a clusterfuck. And, and, and Devon Levi, as we mentioned at the beginning, he was sent down to the minors. I'm totally fine with that, right? Yeah. It, it, to, to come from college into the NHL, for, for it, it goes, it's easiest for, for um, maybe a winger, um, then center, 
then it's hardest for D and it's really hard for a goalie. So like, mm-hmm. I don't think it's a bad thing if he goes down there, even for, for maybe most of the season. I know that's not ideal in his mind, but like, go learn to dominate at the pro level. I'm not worried about that. I kind of see what they're doing there. But I don't know what it is with the Sabres. And I, Dylan Cousins mentioned it. They don't, they, they just kind of float around out there, man. Like, I don't know if fans disagree with me on that or disagree with Cousins. There's not much grit. Like, Cousins said, we need some fuck you to our The game. fact that he's yeah. got to go fight Hathaway, I mean, right. fuck. That tells you everything you need to know. You need to have guys in your lineup who can... Like, those guys should be worrying about playing where the, the, the sandpaper guy should have already been filled in already. I think that they definitely have a lot more of a rope. But I will say who's... I actually think that... Um, and I know that he just signed an extension... Lindy Ruff might be more on the hot seat than than Buffalo's coach, oh. based on expectations. Okay. If things keep going this way, do you? If they're on the outside looking in at the forty five game mark, could you see New Jersey pulling the trigger and 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 bringing in a new coach? I mean, come on, man! Look at the talent they have right now. But uh, the goaltender has not been up to snuff. So if, if they were to dismiss Lindy Ruff, I think the goaltender would probably have a, a significant part of that. I mean, they just haven't been playing to the level. A that, lot of that, that people maybe they agreed with me, RA, in a sense of of they thought that Brunette and uh, I, th- I forget who the other coaches they lost there. That, that that was that was he was doing a lot of heavy lifting and helping that locker room out, and they were having a lot of chemistry going on. So okay. I don't know. Anyway, uh, just to go back to that Cousins quote, uh, Whit, do you think that's sort of a harbinger, like uh, as a, for a coach move, much like Pat Maroon's quote was? Remember Pat Maroon swearing about, oh, we lost fucking seven games in a row. I mean, do, do you see sort of similarities between what Maroon said and what Cousins said, perhaps? Um, maybe a little bit, but like neither one of those guys are directing that towards the coach. Like that's right. that's talking to the room through the media. Like that's there's no coach out there who who who's like at at fault or responsible for guys to play like pricks and, and, and be honey badgers, as Biz says, and be out there just looking to stir it up and, and cause a ruckus around the crease. Like, just that that's on the player. So I think the same way Maroon was saying it, Cousins is saying, like, that's not directed at the coaching staff. Well said, Witt. Uh, and for teams that have made changes right now, the Wild, uh, 3-0 and since John Hines took over for Dean Everson. Uh, they beat up on St. Louis, Nashville, and Chicago. They uh, outscored them 13-3. to They do have Calgary, Vancouver, Edmonton, and Seattle on the horizon, so we'll see what happens there. Uh, as far as the Oilers, they are 6-3 and under Chris Knobloch on a four-game winning streak. They've outscored teams 20-7 to in those four games, and that is largely because of who else? Uh, Connor McDavid. Oh! The guy went from 91st in scoring to 10th in scoring in 10 days. He's got 29 points in 20 games. I know we beat this drum all the time, but uh, this team seems to have really turned the corner, especially uh, Matias Ekholm. Uh, we mentioned it before. They weren't looking like the best him and McDavid, but they are right now. Uh, you're starting to think with that this team does get in the playoffs, this Oilers squad. Uh, yeah, but e- even on this little run, like they're still really looking up the standings, and and uh, like they had a nice little three game win streak, and I think they lost three in a row, but now they're in four in a row. Uh, McDavid, this was a matter of time. I, I said this before. It was going to be a, a 25 points in, 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 I don't know, eight game type run. Like this was a guarantee. So it's happened. He's obviously at a different level, which he's become accustomed to in his career. And everyone's kind of fallen in line. The goaltending settled down a little bit. Um, Jack Campbell's still in the minors. Does he get another chance at some point? I'm not exactly sure, but I, I, I think everyone kind of knew what this this would happen. It's this it's 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 kind of why like Woodcroft being fired was unfair because when your best player isn't best player in the world isn't playing that well for him, like what kind of what are you supposed to do along with not being able to get a save? So they're still like they're st- I mean, I don't know. What are their odds? Can you check that? Geez, they're a website. I, don't know. That gives- I would I would hammer I just got this weird suspicion now that uh, Jack Campbell is going to be the playoff starter for whatever reason. This is just going to be the wackiest if that's of wack the case, years. Like they're not winning anything. What if I, he's I, standing I, on his head, though? I got this weird feeling about the Oilers, man. They got a wacky season going on already. Oh, it hasn't been a wacky year? No, it's been a wacky year. I, I, I just don't think this this team is 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 good enough to compete to win the Stanley Cup. I, 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 I think that, yes, I do think they'll get into the playoffs. Um, I just don't know what they could do in the playoffs. What moves can they make? There's no money that they have available to get rid of Campbell. They'd have to give so much away while get, getting rid of him. It, it, there's just so many question marks still. But with McDavid taking off and probably ending up still leading the league in scoring once this season ends, they should get in the playoffs, yes. They are plus 1,800 to win the Stanley Cup right now. 18-1, to one. okay. 
Uh, also, yeah, what uh, Elliot Friedman said, the Oilers scouts and executives have been at Columbus games lately. I wonder if they're looking at Spencer Martin as a potential goaltender to pick up. Uh, he's only making seven hundred and sixty-two grand. I mean, I know Campbell's played a couple games I in the minors. I think that they're there for Merzlikens, no? I don't know. I mean, they just gave Merzlikens an extension. I don't know if that Edmonton will be willing to take that on. I mean, oh, Spencer okay. Martin's a, the, the cheaper option there. Uh, UFA, he's been playing well. I mean, a 903 save percentage isn't great on its face, but when you're you know, a team like Columbus, they've been struggling. Actually, they've been playing pretty well lately, so we'll keep our eyes on that. But, boys, um, is it time for Mike Delzato or what? I think the Let's ladies have been waiting long enough Let's for him. So, it. All right, so Coach Goody, here's your boy Mike Delzato. Also, a shout-out to the Upper Ottawa Valley Aces. I bet a few of these young boys are up in Sudbury this weekend, so I want to give them a shout-out. So enjoy Michael Delzato. This interview is brought to you by Chevy. Chevy is working to make charging simple. And I think some people have worries about getting an EV vehicle. Where can I charge it? Not with Chevy. All they do is work on giving you more options and better places to charge your truck up. 110,000 charging stations across the U.S. and Canada. And the biggest thing is it's still growing. Your smartphone becomes your co-pilot when using the My Chevrolet mobile app with Energy Assist, and the app allows you to access vehicle information like battery status and charging settings from anywhere. You'll never worry about running out of battery with Chevy and the app. The Energy Assist feature intelligently plans your routes, tells you where and how long to charge up, and gives you real-time data about charging station availability. I want a Chevy EV. I want to be a truck guy, and an EV truck guy actually fits me perfectly, I think. There are three different home charging levels available. Chevy electric vehicles offer great options for charging, all of them as simple as plugging in your smartphone. So 110,000 charging stations and growing. The My Chevrolet app... Everything rolls together. Chevy where it's, Chevy's where it's at. That almost rhymed. Learn more at Chevy.com slash electric. That's Chevy.com slash electric. And as I said, Chevy is working to make charging very simple. All right, it's time to welcome our guest. This defenseman was taken 20th overall by the Rangers at the 2008 NHL draft and spent his first four and a half seasons in New York. He then left his mark in Nashville, Philly, Vancouver, Anaheim, and St. Louis, where he was a member of the 2019 Stanley Cup champions, got his name on the cup, then finished his NHL run with another visit to Anaheim, Columbus, and finally Ottawa. And last week, he retired after a 14-year professional career. Thanks so much for joining us on the Spit and Chicklets podcast. Mike Dalzaro, congrats on the retirement, my friend. Thanks. Thanks for having me. I thought you were going to lose your voice there announcing all the teams I played for. <laughs> <laughs> Fuck, that's a suitcase. That is a suitcase. That is a suitcase. That was just Louis, at the end. Louis, DZ, Louis, it was just at the end. <laughs> yeah, Louis luggage, yeah. Yeah, 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 high end, high yeah, end. Yeah, the bow tag of Veneta. <laughs> <laughs> hey, and uh, in all seriousness, seriousness, though, congratulations, man. That That's an ama- amazing run. When when you decided to to shut it down, was it an emotional day or decision? Was it who, who did you call first type thing? And, and, and was it tough? Uh, definitely tough, but I knew it was the right time. Um, yeah. To be honest, I've been kind of thinking about it the last few years. Um, as you guys know, the politics come into the game. Um, you know, the last few, few teams I, I was on, I was kind of promised opportunities that I was never given. Um, and it, uh, you know, I made it tough to come to the rink every day. So I didn't want to leave the game on a, on a negative note. And, um, you know, as you mentioned, all those teams there, the amount of teammates, uh, staff, um, people at the rink, uh, friends away from the rink, uh, in different cities, um, you know, the amazing, uh, you know, you know, memories that I'll cherish the rest of my life. I didn't want to lose sight of that and, and leave the game on a negative note. You know, I had opportunities to go to Europe. But for me right now, I, I didn't feel like I was all in. And if uh, like anything in life, if you're not all in, it's probably uh, probably time to move on and do something else. And and I think that there's some amazing memories earlier in your career that we'll get into for sure. But like last year, like when you got to San Diego, I mean, you lit it up there. Anaheim's horrendous. Was that something where it's like I can't get called up at the end of the year here to play some games? Yeah. So that was an interesting um interesting process so right before christmas time right before the roster freeze i was actually going to spend christmas with my family i got asked to go play in the spengler cup i want to spend christmas with my family um you know family's everything for me coming from an italian background and then i was actually planning to leave and go play in switzerland the second half of the season and then sure enough two days before the roster freeze i get a call from uh, gregory campbell it says hey we've traded you to uh, san diego go, oh fuck uh, all right uh and at this time i'm kind of debating you know, do I go is really the only place I would have considered going. You know, I love Southern California. I got on the phone with, uh, with the GM there and I asked him straight up. I said, I know, 
you know, it's no secret where you guys are at in the standings. Uh, you guys could use um, some of my experience to help mentor the kids and obviously play as well um, on the ice. And is there an opportunity for me to be called up if I play well? I was told yes. And and to your point of what you said, you know, I, I went to San Diego, absolutely lit it up. We were not a great team there at all. Um, you know, we had most of the guys were 12, 13 years younger than me. And I took on the mentorship role, which I truly cherish and enjoy. And I was just kind of waiting there with my, with my thumb on my ass, waiting for, for a call up. And I never got it. I couldn't believe it. And, you know, every game I'm looking at Anaheim, like getting out shot 50 to 12, you know, 55, 20. And I, you know, <laughs> when is the call coming? And, uh, and it never came. And that's when it kind of, the decision became easy for me. I listen, I've, you know, I've been lied to numerous times and you no, know, I can't do anything about that. Um, hey, uh, so Max Talbot was there, wasn't he in San Diego? He was not. He was there the year before. He was there oh. the year before. Yeah. Okay. Well, my I heard some good. I heard some good good things about him. I know you yeah, guys oh. had some some carryover. Oh, I would have oh, loved to have seen him coaching oh. Biz. Oh, <laughs> he would have been all over guys to block shots. Oh yeah. Uh, you, you mentioned you kind of saw the end coming, and I and I read that you've been a realtor for what four years now. Was that just kind of anticipating the transition and just kind of making sure you had yourself set up for your post career? Yeah. Um, I had a few things Throu throughout my career. Every year I tried either learning a new skill, uh, gaining a certificate, um, doing something that would help me later on and something that would keep my mind off hockey. You know, that's where the DJing start. I picked up, uh, I started playing the alto saxophone again. I've got my private markets license in Canada. <laughs> uh, got my Look real estate license, <laughs> got my real estate license. Um, during the COVID year, the year after COVID, I was playing in Ottawa and we quarantined like three, four different times. And there's only so much TV you could watch. And, you know, my, my forearms are starting to look like Popeye's there. So I had to find <laughs> something else to, to keep me occupied. Uh, and I got the real estate license. And as we know, Florida is kind of the hotbed now. Everyone's moving south because of the weather taxes. Um, you know, no matter what happens in the world, that place will be open. So I figured it'd be a, a good time to, uh, you know, prepare for the next chapter. And, um, and that's what uh, that's what kind of led me to that that path. You said to pick up the saxophone again. Like, did you play it as a kid? I did. Yeah, I did. I played it as a kid. Um, truly enjoyed it. Uh, wasn't a thing that uh, you know you're not bringing that on the road with you. I know guys are bringing <laughs> Xbox, but I think I think the saxophone's a whole other level if you're playing that in the room, keeping the boys up at night. Hank's got his guitar. You got your sax <laughs> on the plane. Just fucking get the whole band, get the whole band going. You and That's Tommy a trumpet just ripping yeah. narco song together. Oh, uh, there we go. See, now we're talking. Unfortunately, the hockey. I can picture that, it, DZ. It, it's a little old school. It's not like baseball or some of the other sports that we have fun like that. That that Timmy <laughs> trumpet entrance was was legendary. We were even joking on, around before uh, we started recording about how like things were getting so squirrely during the the lockdown that we were doing this Pink Whitney Power Hour, and you came on when we were doing the, all the the PlayStation gaming for all the NHL game, and you did a, an hour DJ set for us. How many times did you end up coming on with us? I think it was like three or four. Uh, you know, that was enjoy that was enjoyable. I played. I probably played four or five sets. Uh, now, unfortunately, I didn't do as many as I would have liked or been invited to. Um, you know, it's kind of frowned upon to, to have fun uh, in the game, you know, even in the off season. So I played a, a fun gig in Montreal, uh, played one in Toronto, uh, Miami as well. So I've kind of played all over um, and uh, maybe I'll pick that up now that, now that I'm done. But uh, I remember one in Toronto was one of the you know most fun nights I've ever had. It was the when the World Cup of Hockey was going on. So we didn't start until uh, a little bit later. So I happened to be in Toronto during the Toronto Film Festival and they asked me to play. I got the last hour of dinner into the first night of when the tables cleared and the party started and I uh, killed my set. I had a bunch of buddies there supporting me. And then they had brought this guy in from St. Tropez actually to finish off the night. And he just played a very different genre of music that wasn't... Uh, uh, enjoyed, I guess, by the uh, the younger crowd in Toronto. So I came back on. I remember after my set, I was celebrating my buddy is just slamming the tequila. I'm like, hey, like what a time! Sure enough, I get the tap on my shoulder. Hey, you mind going back on? I, I could barely see straight. Sure enough, we played another four hours. No One shit. of the best nights of my life. Yeah, it's just I ended up doing a six hour set and um, just amazing the power of mu uh, music. Right? You you look around, around the room, no matter where people are from, what they may be going through, the power that music has to put a smile on someone's face or make someone dance um, is remarkable. You'd have to get an RA's bag of treats to, to, to last an extra <laughs> four hour set. Eh? <laughs> what, what would you say to people? Um, you know, like, like even myself at times have been like, well, I don't really understand DJing. Like you got your songs. It looks like, you know, you're kind of just pressing play on the on the computer. But there's so I understand there's so much more that goes into it. 
So like, how are you creating the, the beats and the songs that, that you want to make? So it's, it's pretty simple. You, you have to understand, you got, you got to know the songs you're playing, understand music, and you got to be able to count to four. So I mean, it's not—it's really not that complicated. Fuck, I'm all out. <laughs> yeah, and then, and then after that, it's you, you can get creative in different ways, and then there's so many different effects and whatnot to do it. Um, but that's pretty much the the, the basic steps. And um, I got into it. I've I've seen TS. I don't know how many times all over the world. We became buddies when I was uh, playing in New York, and that was one of the you know probably coolest things of playing in that city. Is you know after a game or or, or any night. You could walk out your door and a couple steps away, a few blocks away, you're watching one of the best DJs in the world put on a, a performance and it's a little different than, you know, some of the other cities I played in where you're kind of stuck at home, um, you know, watching TV and Netflix most of the day when you, when you got back from the rink. You didn't go out much in New York though. You were pretty, not, chill, not, not as much as, <laughs> not as much as people let on, but we had, we had a great group, group of guys. I was 19 when I first started there and uh, my roommate was Brian Boyle. Um, and then later on, you know, the single guys we had, you know, Brandon Press came in. Uh, we had a we had a really fun group, uh, especially playing for Torts. I think it was my third year there. We were first in the conference, uh, and old school coach. The second half of the year, as you know, you play pretty much every other night, and you're trying to get your rest. And um, we didn't ha- as long as we wanted, we perform well. We would come in for games. There would be no morning skate and no practice. So you're basically at the rink every other night, and that was it. So um, we kept winning, and uh, the boys kept enjoying themselves. And uh, you know that city was. It uh, still is so special. I think that one of the greatest things about playing there is, you, you know, you get there in September, you have U.S. Open tennis that week. Follow that up into Fashion Week the next week. Now you're starting your season. Typically into October, uh, the Yankees are good. So you have playoff baseball, you know, football starting up. Um, Christmas time is obviously amazing there too. American Thanksgiving is huge. And then you get the access to restaurant opening, club openings, um, Broadway shows, like you name it. Anything we want to do is it was one text and it was it was handled for us. And, and there's no other city like that. Um, you know, obviously New York being one of the best cities in the world. So to play there is uh is pretty special. Yeah, I think that the Rangers are number one and actually I hate the Leafs, but Toronto's right up there that if you're on a great team in those two cities, like nothing beats it. And you just you just went into New York. Toronto's similar in a way of just being so dialed in, but that's pretty cool to hear. The problem in Toronto though is you, you you can't go to the bathroom without someone, someone knowing what you're doing, right? Where in New York, you think of all the other sports are, are bigger than hockey. Yes, hockey is huge there. Then you have your own, your A-list celebrities, your actors, all that, all that fun stuff. Um, so you're not really, you kind of blend in with the crowd, which is, you know, makes it, um, you know, that much more enjoyable. Well, since we're already into it, I mean, that must have been such a whirlwind for you because you didn't go to the American Hockey League right away. Like you went from playing with the London Knights and then the next year you made the team at a camp. Like how did that how did that camp go? And, and had a year for yourself. And too. Yeah, <laughs> you were unreal your rookie year. And like Torts is typically not a uh, like, I don't know if he doesn't like the young guys, but it's probably harder for, for you as a younger guy to like gain his respect and, and appreciation as a player, right? Yeah, I kind of just came in and, and things just happened for me. You know, it was one of those, um, yeah, it, it's hard to explain. Like it, there was less thinking, just went and played. I had a chip on my shoulder. I wasn't invited to World Junior Camp that summer. Then I ended up going in and playing for the Rangers. So, you know, fuck no, you, Team you Canada right invited. there. It wasn't even, it wasn't even invited. Yeah, still still a little sour to this day. I don't know if you could tell. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but, but the thing with Torts, at, at, that, at that time, I was just – our power play was hot. I was producing points. He didn't really get on me that much. It wasn't until later on. I think he, he saw, I kind of, as he calls it, you know, I had my swagger. Um, he was just letting me do my thing. And then it was later on, we started to butt heads a little bit. Um, you know, he was trying to teach me the art of blocking shots, doing the little things, whatever it takes to win, being a pro. And, and we, we definitely got in a lot of fuck you matches um, for sure. But I had him again when I was 29 in Columbus. Um, and that was a special year for me because I was able to showcase to him like, hey, look what you turned me into. You know, you, I was a boy. You turned me into a man. Now you can see my 200 foot game. Um, and it was a special year for both of us because we had both come a long way. Um, but we definitely we definitely didn't see eye to eye early on. And um, yeah, I mean, I got towards stories for days. He, he was tough on me when we lost to Boston. I know you guys would appreciate this uh, when we lost him. We're at our exit meeting. I come into the room and uh, towards like, so how'd you play? I didn't put up many points, so, which you know, was kind of my job. I'm like, oh, you know, I worked hard. Unfortunately, it was a little snake bitten. Um, you know, could have produced better. Better just points to the door. He goes, get the fuck out. And that was the end of my meeting. <laughs> uh, I'm like 21 years old. I'm like, do I call him tomorrow? Like, how do you, how do you go about this right now? 
And sure enough, we never spoke again until the following, uh, I think it was the following year. He actually might've got fired that summer too. So we didn't speak for a little bit. And, um, you know, he, he's tough to read sometimes. He, he teaches... He teaches lessons in a very interesting manner. And sometimes you don't really understand. I was lucky enough when Brad Richards came in um, to kind of help me along the way and teach, uh, you know, the underlying messages that he was trying to help on the young guys. Well, that's, that's another thing I was going to ask you. Like when you went in there to New York, your first three years, like you had some fucking big hitters come in, not only come in, but were already there. I mean, you had Hank and all these other big names. So just like, like learning off of those guys must've been interesting and maybe go a little bit more into detail about the Brad Richards or Brad Richards thing. Yeah. So I had Gabby my first year, who was probably one of my favorite teammates. I had not, not just on the ice, but off the ice. We saw the game the same way. You know, he had that blazing speed and the very quick release. Um, you know, I think he had 40 something goals that first year we played together. I must have assist, assisted on a good chunk of them. Um, and then Brad Richards came in the third year and he had torts through their cup run in, I think it was 04. So he understood torts. Um, and, and torts pretty much told him, like, hey, take this kid under your wing. He needs a little bit of help. So, so Richie was, uh, you know, taught me a lot along the way. Um, you know, we had Hank there. As you know about Hank, he kind of does his own thing. No one really talks to him. Um, we had so many guys that, that had come through there, so many veteran guys that I was so lucky to, to learn from. Um, Jody Shelley came in there. Oh, um, you know, yeah, we had, to, and at that time, as you know, Biz, we had, that team was known for always having at least one to two heavyweights. Every single year we had big boys. And for me as a young guy, it was nice to have guys, uh, you know, protected me because I did have a little bit of a physical edge. Uh, there's actually an epic clip of Thomas Kopecky kind of like suckering me. Um, in front of the net, and then Rupper comes in, just beats the wheels off him. Oh, yeah, I, I, I owed him dinner after. I actually still might owe him another dinner to this day. Um, but we were fortunate enough, you know, that team was always notorious for having a tough team, especially with Torts. We were never going to get pushed around. Did Did Aves and Torts have some classic fuck you matches in front of the team, or were they uh, pretty chill that season? The, the best one was Gabby, actually. Yeah, uh, he, you know, Gabby was putting up 40 a year in Torts every meeting. We're going to be in the video meeting and every meeting he would show a demon uh, taking a shot and Gabby couldn't be further out of the lane. Wasn't even close. Like we didn't even try to attempt to block the shot. He'd be flying by waiting for a breakaway. Sure enough, towards we get the remote, rewind it, play it. Wouldn't say a word. Might've been four or five times, rewind and play it. And he would just look at Gabby and say, Gabby, I, I know you want to fucking say something, fucking say something. Like towards love confrontation and not because he wanted to go at it with guys. He wanted guys to be honest and he thought it brought the room tighter. So he would go at Gabby all the time. The best video, the best video uh, meeting we had with Torrance, we had Aaron Boros there who we played on the fourth line, had a little bit of skill, but wasn't, wasn't playing a bunch. And uh, we, we lose the night before and Torrance sits right in the middle in the front row. And he goes, AV, like looking around, like, where are you? Like, you know, back here. He goes, AV, you were our best player last night. It was great for you. Not great for the team. <laughs> <laughs> and all the boy, all the boys are bursting. All right, we know he meant well, but like you know, just just abuse the guy in front of the whole team. So he you knew where. He, them. Oh yeah, absolutely, absolutely. You you knew where you stood with Torts at all times, and that's why I respect him as a coach. You're never worrying about you know if you've done something wrong, if you should have done something different. He wore his heart on his sleeve, and he wanted to win as much as the players. And I think he's the, one of the most misunderstood men in hockey. He cares about his players so much, um, and I wish I played for him my whole career. Um, all right, before you hop in here, the Voros thing, were you also there for when, I guess he said something to him sometime in a meeting, oh, no. another positive <laughs> thing. And then he gave him like Shot, the, wink, him the guns, the gave, wink and yeah. the gun. And then Torts just fucking stormed out. He lost it. I don't think he played another game for us after that. If I'm being honest <laughs> with you. Yeah. He said, AV, where are you? And he goes right here, Torts. And he gives him like the double pistols. And he goes, <laughs> he goes, did you just shoot me? He's like, no, you know, I just gave you the pistols and he fucking went off, went off. And I think that was, I think that was the end of his time in, in New York. And I'm not sure his career lasted much longer after that. Yeah. Oh no. Jeez. Uh, Mike, you were the youngest D man in, in team history to play on open night. Then you win rookie of the month, your first year, first month in the league where you kind of like, Oh, this is a little bit easier than I thought given it's the NHL. Yeah. I, Aves used to give it to me. It's like, Oh, you know, the league's so easy. The league's so easy. Again, like I was saying before, I was just kind of riding that high. Things just kind of came together. I wasn't really thinking much. I came in, I was playing first power play. Um, again, Gabrick and I kind of saw, well, how our power play was set up. We had Gabby and then we had Alish Kodalik for the one time on one side. He had an absolute bomb. Couldn't pass the puck for shit, but had a bomb. So it kind of just set up well, where I was able to walk the blue line. I was more of a passer than a shooter. And I don't think many, many guys in the league really knew my game just yet. So 
um, you know, I was able to kind of dish on both sides and, um, and we got hot and, uh, you know, it was a fun time. It was a fun time. As, as you guys know, when you played, you go through those spurts of playing where you're not really thinking the game just kind of comes to you and, and it feels like you're a kid again. It feels like you're playing pond hockey with your brother, with your buddies. And, um, you know, you're just riding that high is, uh, you know, there's no better feeling. I, I forgot about Kota Leak. He was a horse. And I just I just clicked on his hockey DB. And to no surprise, I can't imagine him and Torts loved him. And he, he got traded that year, I saw. <laughs> yeah, Torts yeah. He, get this guy out he, of here. He, he abused them good one day. He abused them good. Mike, I was say, your confidence is probably obviously soaring at that time. What's the first thing that comes along and maybe puts a dent in your confidence that you maybe start second-guessing yourself a little bit? Uh, probably getting walked by a guy on a one-on-one. That'll being, do it. Yeah, or there's a game, I think, in Pittsburgh. I was dash five. And actually, to be honest, I didn't, I didn't even play that poorly. I didn't even play that poorly. It was one of those games. Like, I think one went off, like, my shin padded in. It was just one of those. Like, just get me off the fucking ice. Like, stop, please stop putting me back out there. So there's games like that, those at, at a young age. Because, you know, our division at that time, you know, we're playing Pitt. You know, eight times you had, you know, Crosby, Malkin, all these guys, Latang in, in their prime, uh, Ovechkin in his prime. Like, you know, our division was was stacked and seeing those guys night after night as an offensive defenseman who didn't really understand or care to play defense at that time was, was really humbling, really humbling. What was your worst night wit dash four? Yeah. Uh, first game back in Pittsburgh too, uh, as a member of the Anaheim ducks, all fired up dash four. We lost like four, nothing too. <laughs> oh no. Randy was, Randy was, like, was probably impressed. Like, I could just sense the end coming. I was like, this is not good. <laughs> If I was that fired up to play, it still went dash four. Yeah, th- those are the worst too. You can't sleep that night. You're just waiting to get called in the office the next day or yep. see your name out of the lineup on the board. Uh, brutal. You you mentioned Tiesto, meeting him. Of course, you probably met a ton of celebrities. Uh, what's this uh, Meghan Markle story I heard about? <laughs> you gotta- oh, it's a it's a great it's a great story. So uh, Suits was one of my favorite shows. It was filmed in Toronto. Um, Lewis on the show, Rick Hoffman is his real name and in, in, uh, his, his name in real life. He was a big Rangers fan. I got, we, we were put in touch. I'm, I'm not sure through who, through who he came to a game. We met afterwards, exchange information. We kind of went out for a couple of times uh, in Toronto. We grabbed a drink. Uh, we'd just be in touch. Um, I remember I got him a signed hat uh, by all the boys and he was, you know, extremely thankful for it. Um, and through these times, Megan, Megan was around with them, you know, co-stars on the show and, uh, she was married at the time. Uh, we have a, we had a picture of us together where I think it was the three of us were out. I believe it was Soho, Soho house in Toronto. We had a drink, um, before dinner, uh, fast forward. She's now engaged to, to the Prince and headlines are blowing up. Everyone's digging into her past her past dating history, who she knows. I started getting calls. Like I, we we're friends. You know, I was friends with her through Rick <laughs> Sure enough, my mom's getting called. They, they get access. The, the British press is getting access to my mom's cell phone asking, hey, did your son and Meghan Markle have relations? My mom's like, like what, what the fuck is going on? She calls me right away. I'm like, okay, now I'm embarrassed. We're in Vancouver. We don't have a practice rink. We practice, like the odd time we have to, there's something going on at, uh, at the arena. We would practice at um, UBC, the uni- university rink there. So we practice. I'm walking out. Sure enough, this guy sprints over at me and his accent goes, did you have... Uh, relations or, or uh, yeah, did you have relations with Meghan Markle? I'm like, who the fuck is this guy? What this guy asked me? And sure enough, in the background, there's probably, I don't know, like four cars in the background and there's numerous cameras um, taking pictures and video of me. The paparazzi's <laughs> back there asking, like, what the fuck is going on right now? I sprint to my car. A bunch of the boys come over. They call me after, like, what is going on? I'm like, I don't know. Apparently, I dated her or was married to, to Meghan Markle. So that's uh, that was a, a rude awakening for me. You got to be careful with who you're friends with and what pictures you post out there because nothing ever happened. But uh, the paparazzi somehow found me and and uh, and my mom. That's Rory fun. McElroy That's was psycho. hanging out with her too. I think. Apparently, apparently, you never know the real story though. Who knows? No, you never do. Yeah, who knows? Maybe I'm just reading this British press bullshit. Hey, good. Hey, good for the Instagram. I bet you got a couple extra followers for that. Yeah, couple yeah, British that right. I like this guy. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, it was uh, it was interesting times, but but to your point about Tiesto, we had again in New York the access we had and uh, the amount of people we met. Um, you know, as you know, at MSG, right behind the bench, all the celebrities are there, so we got access to meeting them all the time. Um, you know, Liam Neeson is a staple. Um, the Sports Illustrated girls were there all the time, so the boys used to get a kick out of that one. Um, this is this is before the days of uh, of Instagram, unfortunately, so it's tough to get a hold of. 
What, I, I was texting Avery. I was asking for a little dirt on you uh, as far as the, the the supermodels. Was it St. Ginsburg? Was that the one? There, there's uh, there there's a few that were kicking around New York at the time when, uh, during those days. I was hot. Not so much the days I was Dash Five. Wasn't getting a lot of uh, a, a lot of uh, responses back after those ones though. He he was he was. I'm trying to read this. He goes, uh, "Oh Jesus, he's an animal." And then he he goes, ask him about Amy Sacco. She's an NY legend, and she ran the toughest club in NY Bungalow 8, and she loved DZ. That's what his comments that, were. Yes, yes. Uh, she did run run one of the best clubs in, in New York City. Um, we used to go out, I mean, to numerous spots when, when the time allowed, and it was like, you know, you're looking over, you got Little John, Usher. I think that my first night out, Usher was beside us. The next one was Little John. Then we go out uh, to another spot, probably the following year, and we're partying with with Leo and Jonah Hill. And we're like, these are like oh, big, shit. big boys. Yeah, these are yeah, these are legends. And you're looking around, and yeah, I'm a, a 19, 20 year old kid from Stovall, Ontario. I come from a town of twenty thousand people, and here I am with with Leo partying up in New York City. And that's when I was like, hey, this is. You know, this is this pretty is dope. National League. Well, you know, yeah, Avery, exactly. he doesn't hang around with civilians, so of course no, you have to no, hang no, around. No, he doesn't. He, <laughs> no, he doesn't. He doesn't. He took me. You know what? You know, say what you want about him. I know there's obviously a lot of mixed reviews out there, but especially my first year, uh, he was very kind to me. He took me under his wing. I remember one of the one of my first weeks there. He picked me up in his his Audi, his his uh, A8 eight at the time. I remember the car. I was driving around. He took me shopping. He's like, "Hey, you need this. You need this. You need this." And kind of got me my my New York staples when I first got there. So he was uh, he was great to me. Uh, that first season in, in New York, who did you primarily play with your rookie season? Uh, Michael Roosevelt. Man, that guy was a solid fucking player, dude. And he was sneaky Pittsburgh. hands. P- Pittsburgh yeah. got rid of him. I think he tore. You'll you'll know. I think he tore his ACL like three times, didn't he? Yeah, both knees. He's, yeah, both really banged up. You know, he was phenomenal. He was an older guy. He was great to me too. It was him, Vinny Prospo, and Marion Gabrick. So the Czech, two Czechs and Slovaks, we sat at a card table together. I was 19. I played cards with these guys. So I, some of the other guys weren't, weren't overly happy, but those guys kind of ran the table and they invited me in and they played this European game that um, it's called Joker for them. It's a different name in Italian that I grew up playing. So uh, no one else knew the game. Um, so they were, uh, they were great to me. Rosie was you know, a veteran guy at the time, sneaky, good hands, phenomenal passer, phenomenal vision. Um, you know, he really helped me that year. Yeah, sneaky good like little toe drags. Like, yeah, you're right. Sneaky good hands. I play with him as well. I think of in he Arizona. Did. Yeah, he he's just a cups, he, right. He's just a winner. Yeah, he was with Chicago. That's where he won his cups, I believe. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Correct. W- were you surprised when you ended up getting traded to Nashville? I actually, I, I asked to be traded um, once Torts left. Uh, Vigneault had come in. Um, he, I never played the right side in my in my in my career. I actually started off as a four. I guess we go back to that. I started off as a four. I switched to defense at 12 years old. My dad saw that the strength of my game was my vision and passing. He's like, you should quarterback a power play and be able, you know, to move the puck from the back end. Um, so I got to thank him for my career. Um, didn't really give me the longest of, of, of leashes. We didn't see eye to eye. Um, and yeah, I wasn't playing there. And I just, yeah, I'd asked for a trade. I didn't know what was, it was kind of the first, I guess, experience for me of the business side. And um, was, was a tough one. I got called into the office. I think it was 2 p.m. Uh, the practice rink, and I had a flight that night at nine p- nine p.m. to meet the team in uh, Nashville's in Vancouver on the road. So I remember I packed up a couple bags, uh, flew out to Vancouver, and thank God my sister in law's family's out there. So they met me at the airport, greeted me, kind of comforted me a little bit. You know, at that time I was actually living. My my brother had been transferred to New York for work, so myself, him, uh, his now wife, but uh, girlfriend at the time, the three of us lived together. So I had a pretty pretty epic setup there. Um, you know, the, my last year and a half, we had this great, great loft. Uh, my sister-in-law would kind of be doing her thing. And my brother and I was whatever, 22, he was 25. And we were playing mini sticks, like we we're eight years old again. So we had, we had, we had a, a great time. They came to every game. We go for dinners after we got to experience the city together. Um, and that was, um, you know, probably the best stretch, um, in my life as far as, ha- as far as happiness, just being able to, to enjoy all these moments with my brother. Did you ever express to Vino like how uncomfortable you were playing the right side? Like, yeah, I was kind of the same way. Like it's it's just so much different breaking the puck out. I don't know if you talked to him about it, and he was just like tough shit. Yeah, yeah. It was a one. It was a one sided conversation. Yeah, yeah. The right side, as you get used to it, it's it's not that bad. 
Um, it's good I, offensively. For sure, for sure. There, there's breaking the puck out brutal in the neutral zone brutal, right? You're yes. losing a stick length of space to be able to make an outlet pass, which especially with how fast the game is now makes a world of difference. In the ozone, being able to walk the blue line on your forehand is great. Um, you know, there's different and you're always in a one-time position. There's different instances that is great. I think for defending, actually, the rush is actually nice too because you have a little bit longer of a stick. Um, but it takes time. It wasn't until uh, I played in Anaheim uh, with Cam Fowler, actually, that I played the right side that I actually started to enjoy it. It also helps, you know, who's your partner. Certainly helps, helps the game a little bit more. If you have a guy that can break the puck out and you're able just to go D to D and let him, you know, uh, do most of the work, it certainly makes your, your job easier. I, f- I feel like there's a shortage of NHL right-handed defensemen, and there always really is. There's so many left hand, left-handed defensemen. Yeah, it's probably a little easier though on the right side when you're when you're uh, getting a D to D in your own end to kind of pick it off the wall. Like whereas like you uh, open up open up behind the net, no. Yeah, but you don't yes see the no. blind side. Yeah, you don't see the blind side. So if some guy's forechecking down the wall, you're you're probably in the quiet. You're getting room Colby Armstrong. Bit. Yeah, yeah, exactly, <laughs> you're exactly. In the quiet room, he said. <laughs> yeah, yeah, oh yeah, for a while, for a while. Um, but but I expressed this to to AV and yeah, it was a one one sided conversation. I didn't even have a backhand there, so there was no way I was playing the fucking right side. <laughs> that would have been a nightmare. Now, you you signed been. an extension at nine days before the, the trade. Did you know the trade was coming? Did you already kind of put your request in before then? How did, how come they decided to uh, sign you? Just make, make it easy to trade you, basically the ranges. No, my extension I signed it in in the off season. It was right before the the COVID years when I signed that extension. Oh, okay. Yeah, uh, yeah. Hockey reference did me dirty. Though. Yeah, yeah. I know hockey. <laughs> yeah, not uh, not to not to burst your uh, no. That's your right. I, there, but yeah, yeah. But you went to uh, Switzerland during, during the lockout for a little bit, right? I did. I did. That was a, a great, it was a great experience. I was in, uh, in Switzerland, you have the, you know, the Italian, the, the, the French and German speaking that's kind of split up. I unfortunately was in the German speaking part and it was, uh, it was eye opening. You know, I was still young, um, moved there. Most of the guys didn't speak English. I go out for dinner and, you know, at this time there wasn't, you know, the Google translate and stuff. We, you know, the access to these, all these apps we have on our phone now. So I was kind of guessing and just pointing at something, to, um, to order off the menu. And that's when I actually learned how to cook. So I could go, I'd go to the grocery grocery store and actually see what I was, I was cooking and making. Um, and it was, uh, to be honest, I got homesick there. It, it was tough, um, hurt my back and I ended up coming back early, uh, to get myself health, healthy for the start of the next season. How did you end up over there? Did uh, someone recommend it? Just kind of took a fly. Yeah. yeah. I think at that time with, with the age I was at, I had to keep playing, keep developing and, and stay on the ice and, um, you know, my agents kind of recommended that and uh, it was an easy decision. Well, Spezzo was over there with you. I play, I play with Spets. Yeah. Yeah. I play with Spets. He, he, we're, had, we're he, seemed like he had a pretty good time there. He was a point of game guy, played like what, yeah. close to 30 games. Yeah. He, uh, he had his family with him, right? He's a little different. So we were in a very, very small town. It's beautiful right off Lake Zurich. Uh, but it was a small town. There's, you know, there was nothing going on. I wasn't walking outside my apartment door to see TS still light it up. You know, it was, uh, I was in, in, in bed. Lights were out by nine o'clock. Yeah. So then that off season after that Nashville experience, you end up getting what a, a nice contract in Philadelphia. Like what, what was the off season like there? Like negotiating with teams? Like, did you, did you go visit there at least first or? No, I actually had nothing. I didn't sign until August. I had nothing. And, and that was one of, there's two or two or three different, moments in my career where I thought I was done. And then this was one of them. I ended up signing with Philly, a one-year deal in August. I get there, play a little bit. And then I go through a stretch. I think it was almost a month I didn't play. And this is when I'm like, I remember calling my brother. I'm like, fuck it. Like I'm done with it. Let's figure out another plan. I got to go back to school. I got to do this, got to do this. So I signed up for some classes, um, was still working my tail off, waiting for an opportunity. Sure enough, I think it was like January comes, I get an opportunity and from then to the to the end of the year, so whatever that three and a half, four and a half months was the hottest I've been in my in my career. It's like I was I think I had like four or five game winners. It's like every goal, it's like every time I touch a puck, like Jake Voracek would uh, enter the zone, he'd pull up, hit me late, and it was like everything, bar down, bar down. Like I couldn't <laughs> miss. And it was a, it was like such a such an amazing, amazing stretch. I was playing, I went from not playing like a month or so to playing 25 minutes a night, power play, penalty kill, five on five, scoring game winners. It was um it was awesome. And then that next summer, uh, I signed a two-year extension. That's where I made my most money. So um, those are like the moments I was really proud, most proud about myself with my career is, you know, there was some dark times and some times where I thought I was done and, and 
continuing to believe, continuing to work hard and waiting for that next opportunity and, and overcoming that adversity, um, you know, made the next, uh, the next chapter that much more uh, enjoyable and rewarding. The champagne Don, Jacob Voracek. He was just, <laughs> he, was he doing these crazy, uh, the, the sing-alongs in the room at the time? Who's his guy, the boss? Oh yeah. Oh yeah. He, I, I could go on. I, there's not enough time to tell Jake Voracek stories. My, my favorite one, my favorite one about this guy, my favorite PG one, at least he, he comes in the training room and you know how he talks, right? He comes in the training room. My foot's fucking broken. He goes to the trainer. My foot's fucking broken. Like you, you block a shot. He goes, no. Like, did you roll it? He goes, no, I, I don't know what I did. A couple of days come later. My, my, it's fucking broken. It's fucking broken. Like you, you got to do something about it. He can't get his foot in his skate. So he's going to get to CT scan, gets an MRI, gets an X-ray. It's not, it's not broken, Jake. Like, I, don't, I don't know what to tell you. Like, it's, it's not broken. You seem to think it is. This is a proof. Shows that it's not. Long story short, this goes on for a couple of weeks. They find out later he's got gout. This guy was a 27-year-old professional oh, athlete no. with gout. He's, his diet consisted of Pilsner, red wine, Wagyu specifically. He didn't touch any, any other type of meat, Wagyu <laughs> and sushi. The amount of food oh this God. guy put down the night before, he put down enough for a table for four for himself. It, it, it was disgusting. Disgusting how much he ate. But then the next night, he'd go in and he'd be the best player on the ice. He's, he's as, as much as the game has changed, he, has a, he is as old school as they come. He still, he still has that old school mentality. And he was, he was a special human and, and a special player. Like he, was, he was one of my favorite teammates. But the shit he did on a daily basis, you, you, couldn't, you could not believe. I don't even think I'd heard of gout till I was oh, 35 no. years old. The worst. Yeah, yeah, exactly. 20s. Exactly. All right. You had to have gotten gout. Oh, well, it's the king's disease it. though. And Vorchek kind of is the king. Said. He is the king. He is the king. Yeah, exactly. He, it's very, he wasn't it's shy very to fitting. spend it either, right? No, no. He lived his life. You know, and I respect <laughs> that about him. He, he worked his eye. He was a phenomenal player, but he lived his life. He, he enjoyed life every day. And I, and I respected that about him. His pay That's tolerance awesome. must have been through the roof, man. Cause business, I did have gout years ago and it was the worst pain you put a bed sheet on your toe and it, it hurts i don't know how a freaking guy played hockey man but yeah what, were you finally buying like good cannabis is that how you got it <laughs> no <laughs> buying, like, shit actually <laughs> good meat he was he was eating good meat for the first time actually when it was yeah. a, after a weekend up saratoga too, too much red wine and seafood that's what that's what did me in but not going it has happened since but you and Jakey Voracek, you got something in common. <laughs> I wanted to go back to when you mentioned that summer, not having anything till August. I mean, you're you're 24. You've had some great years. Like, what do you think you could? Can you contribute that to anything? Like, I, I, I you must have been confused. Maybe talking to your agent, like, how am I not getting offers right now? There was numerous years I was confused. I, I just, you know, I'm looking at my stats. I'm looking at what other guys are getting, and you're comparing it. And uh, there's numerous times I was motherfucking my agent. I'm like, I, yeah, explain it to me. Like, please explain it to me because there's. Like it's, it's pretty straightforward. You go on, you go online, you type in someone's numbers and it shows their comparables, right? It's not that, it's not that complicated to do a contract anymore. And I couldn't believe what some guys were getting. And, and I wasn't, wasn't even getting a call. And, and there was, it was tough. It was tough. You know, I, that summer I was training with Matt Nickel, one of the best in the business. Um, and he was, you know, as amazing as he was on the strength and conditioning side, he was so good for me mentally, just keeping me even keeled at all times. Um, you know, he, you know, he resurrected my career. He was so great for me. Um, but each summer, you know, again, there was numerous times where, uh, you know, even at my time in Ottawa, you look at my numbers there and you know, I got sent down to the minors because they wanted to, uh, to, to wake the team up. I it was told at the end of the season, oh, you were the scapegoat. You know, your teammates liked you and we had to uh, send you down to uh, shake things up. In what world is that normal? Like, I, like it, makes, it makes zero sense. So uh, numerous times throughout my career. And, and as I mentioned before, it was one of the reasons why, you know, it was kind of time for me. I didn't want to feel like I had to keep begging for jobs or begging um, someone to at least accept my phone call. And, you know, not only just the hockey side, but as a person, um, you know, I take pride in who I am as a teammate and as a friend, as a human being, you know, I was, I was raised very well. I have amazing parents and I want to be appreciated for who I am as a person. And it just felt like I got to the time where, where that wasn't happening. I didn't want to keep, you know, begging to be around people who didn't appreciate me for who I was. I, uh, I love how you brought up Matty Nickel. I think the first time I ever met you was at the BioSteel camp. And just like he was working out of St. Mike's in that small little rugged gym, like like Rocky Balboa style. But he is such an unbelievable guy. And like you said, he just had such a way of how he interacted with the guys and made them feel comfortable and helped them through not only the training side of it, but the mental side as well. Yeah, he he's out of that gym now, unfortunately. That was my favorite place. It, it's, you know, it wasn't about the bells and whistles and 
uh, the chef and this and that. It was, you were there to work. You showed up, you put your work boots on, you got your work in small room. You know, we had a, you know, an epic crew of, you know, still to this day, three, uh, three of my buddies who don't play hockey anymore. Um, there's four of us. We worked out at 6 a.m. every morning and we had such an amazing time there. So it takes a special human to get up at 5.30 every day, go in there, toss the iron around. Most guys are, you know, still drooling on their pillow. And these guys were, were amazing people. And um, again, still to this, this day, we're best friends. And going in there every day, I truly enjoyed it because I knew I was getting better. And I was, I was around like-minded people and, and having someone like Maddie lead the way, um, you know, he's, he's the best in the business. He's the best at what he does. Um, and I was very fortunate to have him in my corner for, for I think seven or eight years I trained with him. That's awesome. Uh, you mentioned your dad, you mentioned your dad earlier, um, in, in terms of switching from forward to defense, I was reading, he was, he was drafted in the CFL. Like, did he, did he get you <laughs> into hockey? No. Fake news, fake news. Oh, That's another one. Yeah, really? yeah, no, you can't, you can't believe everything. Hey, I just told you a story about Megan Mark. You can't believe everything you read online. You can't believe it. <laughs> no, my, my dad, my dad wasn't drafted the CFL. No, he, he played put hockey. It, he put it on the internet though. Yeah, actually, yeah. exactly. Yeah. Street credit for him. No, he, he played hockey, not at a high level, uh, but he always saw the game well. And, and he was my, um, you know, my biggest supporter is definitely hard on me too. Uh, you know, for him, it wasn't about the points. It was the work ethic and instilling those values of me and work ethic, perseverance, being a good teammate. Um, instilling those at me at a young age was, uh, you know, I can't thank my family enough. The, the hours they put into bringing me to the rink, uh, cooking, you, you name it. Both my parents worked. They still didn't miss coming home, cooking for me, bringing me to hockey practice. My brother played hockey as well. Um, so the lessons I learned from them, um, you know, inspired me to be the, uh, uh, the person I am today. And you wore number four, uh, cause you loved Bobby Orr. Yeah. Yeah. Obviously didn't get to watch him play. Uh, he was my dad's favorite player. And at the time, uh, you know, there was only VHS. So I watched the best of Bobby Orr tape. I don't know how many yep. times. And, and he was, uh, you know, innovated the, the, the position. He was the, you know, the first offensive defenseman completely changed the game. Um, so it was him. And then as far as guys, that were playing when I grew up playing. Scott Niedemeyer was probably the one defenseman that um, was my favorite. Joe Sackett was my favorite player, period. But as far as defenseman was Niedemeyer, just how effort, effortlessly he skated, um, his ability to join the rush, how smart he was. His IQ on the ice was um, you know, second to none. Whip played with him. Wouldn't he do the crossword in four minutes? He would come off the ice Whip after playing 32 minutes. Sweat. And- he didn't, he didn't have, he didn't have a bead of sweat in the middle of his chest. Had a quarter size like album of sweat on his chest after 33 minutes, and he was he was also a snap show. People like didn't know, <laughs> really didn't realize that he's oh yeah, dude. When he got pissed off on the ice, like very very quiet guy, you know, like simple person. But dude, remember when he took the slap shot at uh, yeah uh, Alfredson <laughs> in the Cup Finals? No, yeah, yeah oh, I don't an remember. Animal. He was an animal. Would he wait to snap in the room, or he'd just snap on the bench? No, he wouldn't even snap on the he he uh, he wouldn't even snap on the guys. He would he would just like snap on the ice against somebody else. Like I remember one time he like ran over Datsuk. He was just he would get pissed off in the middle of the games, but he was so odd for him because he was so quiet in the room that you could just see that side of him. But it was in, it was incredible. The, I got to play on a team with him and Pronger, and they both play, probably played thirty five minutes. And it was just, they were such different people off the ice and then on the ice, different in ways, but also dominating. So I could see why he was your guy. Yeah. I mean, Prongs had a, a little bit of a mean streak too. Oh, a little bit. Yeah. Just a bit. Oh. Mike, even though Nash was a, a brief stint, like 25 games, did you still pick up like good habits and like maybe career advice just from being around a guy like Shea Weber for a few months? Yeah, absolutely. You know, we had a, you think of the decor we had there, Shea Weber, Roman Yossi, Ryan Ellis, Matthias Ekholm, Seth Jones, wow. and, and, and that team—that team wasn't very good that year. They didn't make the play. They actually weren't very good at all. But you think now, you know, unfortunately, Ellis with the injury. But you think what those defensemen all turned out to be like? That's a—that's that's an all-star. All five of those guys are all-stars, essentially, right? Like these are premier defensemen. So to have kind of all those guys that you were able just to practice with every every single day made you a better hockey player. Had Suter already left? Yeah. Yeah. Okay, because they had him right before. So as far as yeah. Boyle and drafting defensemen, he was lights out. Yeah, yeah, he was one of the best. He had, he had an eye for defensemen, that's for sure. Now, that was kind of, I think, real early, maybe Yossi's first or second year. Could you tell, though, maybe not that he was going to be a 90-point guy, but could you tell right away, like, future superstar here? He was good. He was good. Nine, I mean, 90 points, 
it's hard to predict that. I think anyone who thinks that you'd say they're full of shit. Like it's just, it's crazy yeah. numbers, but just watching him every day, similar to Niedermeyer. I don't think he's as good of a skater. He's, he's definitely a great skater, but same, same thing. The guy just skated up and down the ice. He never got tired. He was so like, I, I don't know. I don't know what it was about him. He was just able to get up and down the ice every shift. He joined the rush somehow. He'd be the first guy back. Um, and he just made the game look so easy. It's hard because we got to go over all these teams and places you stop. So <laughs> I, I, gotta, I know. I know. Have, I don't we, have have two, we, have. we have to do a two-parter. I want to skip right to you getting to win a Stanley Cup. And, you know, you talked about how halfway through your NHL career, you thought maybe you'd be done and you're looking maybe looking to, online for what you're going to do next. But you end up getting the opportunity with the St. Louis team. Now, were you there? Uh, were you, you weren't really there during that turmoil in January when they were in last place, right? No, I wasn't there. So that was an interesting year. I started off in Vancouver. I'm, I'm coming off a year, my first year in Vancouver, this only year in my career I played 82 games. So that was special for me. You know, battled through some injuries, but was able to play all 82, um, the first and only time in my career. Next year, we're kind of going through that, you know, rebuilding phase. So they got to play the young guys. They give me the bullshit excuse. Oh, we got to play this guy. We got to play this guy. I get traded to Anaheim. I get to Anaheim. We're kind of still in the mix. Uh, we're in the playoff hunt play a couple games and now I'm partnered with Cam Fowler. And this was probably the most fun I was having playing hockey. I I've had playing hockey as far as chemistry with the partner. We saw the game the same way. The game was so easy. We read off each other. Uh, it was a blast. It was a complete blast. We lose back-to-back -back divisional games right before the deadline. It puts us eight or 10 points out of a playoff spot. The deadline's the next day. We're in Vancouver again. You know, that's something about that place fucking haunts me. Every time I'm there, I get traded. Um, the deadline's over at 12. Sure enough, we got to call at 1210. Bob Murray, like we, we've traded you to St. Louis. I, I knew there was teams that were calling about me. St. Louis was not one of them. So Chief was there. I had Chief in, in, in Philly. Alex Petrangelo, the captain there. Um, one of my closest friends growing up. Uh, Braden Shen was there who I played with in Philly. So I think there might have been um, some talks uh, amongst them that got me there. I go to St. Louis. And as we all know, they went from last place to... Um, whatever they're into a playoff spot, hottest team in the league. So I play a couple games. No one really gets hurt. We go on this playoff run. And now we're in like, you know, a month, two months. I haven't played a game. It's like every day I'm like, fuck, am I going to get in? Clearly not. You're at that point where like, you're not wishing for an injury, but like you're wanting to get in. You're wanting something to happen because you want to play. You want to perform. We're athletes, right? We're, we put all this work and we've put all this work in for so many years that you're just waiting for that opportunity. Every day I was first guy at the rink. First guy in the gym, first guy on the ice. I'd be at the gym. Uh, Jay Bowmeister would be the next guy in there. Very, oh, yeah. very quiet guy. I'd be in the gym, have the tunes fucking blaring, right? I'm going through, you know, now we're on, we get to the to the cup final and now we're on, you know, two, three months. I haven't played. So I'm looking for any type of motivation. I have the tunes blaring. I'm absolutely shredded at this time. All I'm doing is basically working out, skating on the ice, playing golf and tennis. Like that, that was my life for, th for three months. And I worked my ass off because I wanted a, the coaches and B the players and see the staff to know that, Hey, God forbid someone were to get hurt or something that would, would happen. This guy is ready to step in. And I know I can trust him to do his job. So I did that for three plus months. And, and because of that, and I didn't know, no one really said anything to me. And it wasn't until me want until we won that I had numerous guys come up to me, you know, thanking me for the work ethic I put in. And, and they saw that every single day. And that's essentially why I got my name on the cup because, you know, technically with the rules, I didn't have the qualifications, um, you know, to get my name on there, but they made an exception just because of the teammate I was and the work ethic I put in. That's so awesome, that was dude. one of the most rewarding um, experiences of my, not even my, my, my career, but my life, because you know, you never know who's watching. Um, and I, and I put that work in waiting for that opportunity and, and I didn't know if it would ever come again. Obviously it didn't. And, um, you know, I mean, you know, I get goosebumps, uh, you know, just talking yeah. about it. It was, uh, you know, very thankful for the guys to to appreciate the effort I put in and 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 see what I was doing every single day. And, and myself and Wit spent some time there, like just an unbelievable group in St. Louis. Like you go from like all, like their leadership. You talked about Bo Meester, Petro, Steen. I mean Steen up front. Like they just had so many guys, and that group was so fun to be around. We were so rattled when we got let go off our PTOs. I would have stayed <laughs> around for the whole year to full towels. <laughs> That's how fun that group was. I got let go twice. <laughs> they they were they were a good group, and that's what you can attest to. You know, to them winning. I think any any winning team, you have to have that chemistry in the room. Those guys would have done anything for each other. Uh, great coaching ch coaching staff. You know, Chief is a is a great players coach, but demands work ethic and and the details of the game. Uh, and they got hot at the right time. You know, it's as bad as they were. They 
you know, one thing turned around, next thing you know, Binner came in, um, he was on fire and the team just kind of, you know, rode the wave. And, and the next, uh, next thing, you know, we're, we're lifting the cup at the the parade and, in St. Louis that we're on the PJ taking it to Vegas and with Grinelli. <laughs> yeah, it was, uh, that was, that was a fun couple of days, fun couple of days. How, how tense was that Boston series? Just like the, the, the finals. Cause it was, it was back and forth. You guys end up yeah. going in there for game seven, like any specific moments you can remember where Berube gave a speech or maybe a guy spoke up. Not really. I, the team just kind of knew where, where they were as far as the opportunity at hand. And there was just a quiet, confidence about the group it wasn't that anyone needed to step up even you know look at alex petrangelo not a very vocal captain but that guy eats minutes plays the right way is an absolute fucking warrior and has done it year after year obviously they won again last year like to have a guy like that in your room is you know what a treat what a treat to have mike those 12 games uh with anaheim were they under randy uh Kyle, bob mario did you get both both coaches get double whammy with them (laughs) <laughs> yeah, double whammy, Randy, and then oh. uh, and, and then and then Bob came on the bench, which was oh. interesting. He wasn't coaching; he was just evaluating. No shit, oh, really? What? Oh yeah, yeah. yeah. So it wasn't saying anything; it was just kind of seeing what was going on. And and uh, yeah, that was well. Boys were boys were how how tight were the arms? Ripping the, yeah, oh, Ty ripping the sticks, the ripping the sticks. Yeah, yeah. So that was an interesting. <laughs> I never seen that before. It's like the GM which you never really saw that all of a sudden he's behind the bench and didn't say a word, no pregame speech, no nothing. Just like he was, there. It, it, it was, it was outrageous. I, I could not believe what I, what I was witnessing. What was Getsy saying? Not much. He just, he just like, <laughs> he'd been there so long. I think he'd seen so much there. He just say, he, there was nothing that surprised him. Yeah. And he, and he ran the show. I just want to go back to like your thought process there when you're with St. Louis, like where did you gain that mindset? Was that something that you always had throughout your entire career, even through the ups and downs? Like where, who, did your father instill that in you? Like, where did that come from? You know, I, I always had that chip on my shoulder. Um, you know, anytime someone doubted me, I kind of remembered, I would always keep that as, as fuel in the back of my mind. Actually, this is a bizarre uh, memory. And, and I haven't even told him this to this day. My uncle made a comment to me at like eight years old. You know, I was a very talented hockey player at the time, but my brother was always, uh, he was a much harder worker. And I remember my uncle said like, Oh, if only, if only you had your brother's work ethic, what you could do. I was like eight years old. Like my uncle said it to me, he probably doesn't even remember saying it to me. I've never had this conversation with him. And that to this day still sticks in my mind. Like my uncle kind of called me out at a young age. And I was like, you know, what? fuck you. I'm going to prove you wrong. And it was just, from then on, from you know the world jun- not getting invited to world juniors, um, you know any uh, NHL draft, I was told I was going to go top ten, and they slide to twenty. It was like always just using the you know the haters, if you will, um, as motivation and fuel. And and that year, um, you know that year I dealt with a lot of being in a Canadian market in Vancouver. I you know I, I took a lot of flack, and then going to going to Anaheim, kind of having fun again. And then it was just like every time I felt like I was getting confident, enjoying myself, I was like nope here you are a little taste of humble, a little slice of humble pie, yeah. you know, back down to, to reality. And I just never wanted to lose that, um, that chip on my shoulder. And that's one thing I've always said, like, no matter what's happened at the rink, whatever it may be in life, I will always give 110%. I will always put my best foot forward. And then I can go to bed, look at myself in the mirror and I can sleep, sleep easy at night. And if you can do that, the rest is out of your control, especially, you know, in the game of hockey, the amount of shit that goes on that's out of your control is, is, um, is unfortunate. So you put your best foot forward, you work your ass off, you be a good team. I know it's very cliche, but it's the truth. And because of that, I got my name on the Stanley Cup. That's fucking awesome, dude. That is awesome. I, I you know, D- Dallas Eakins, he took some flack in, in Edmonton when he got there and got rid of the, the junk food for the reporters. And then obviously at his time in Anaheim, like what was he like as a head coach? Was he kind of a hardo or was, was he a good guy? Like I always kind of wondered what it would be like playing for him because I'd heard different stories. He, he was a good guy. I, I really enjoyed him as a human being and a coach. Nice. Unfortunately, his hands were tied there with yeah. Bob. You know, we had a younger team and he had to play certain guys. So there, uh, you know, like we were talking about before, looking at other guys and the money they're making, the opportunities they're getting there. I was, you know, I was playing phenomenal. You know, I was like one of the few plus players for a good stretch of that, that year. And we were, we were horrendous, right? We, we didn't even belong in the league. Like we were that bad. And no matter how well I played, there was, um, a rule there, no matter how well I played, it was every two games I rotated in and out of the lineup. I remember after one night, I think oh, I was shit. one and one, I was one and one against Tampa. And that time I was, you know, the Tampa glory days. I was one and one against Tampa. And again, we're a horrendous team. 
They're a cup contender. And I was supposed to come out the next night. I remember calling Dallas. I'm like, there's no way you can fucking take me out. I was our best player last night. I was one and one. And he's like, yeah, I, I know, I know, but this is how it works. So he kind of made an exception to put me in for that third game. But it didn't matter what your performance was. You were in and out of the lineup. And, and that's not how I was, the values I was raised upon with my parents. And then that's not how I was brought into the league either. Because with that's torts, not the NHL. It, I, exactly. That, that's not any successful business, you know, yeah. really. But with torts, it didn't matter if you made league minimum or $10 million a year if you were 19 or you were 40. If you deserved to play, you played. And, and it, it, there was there's no gray area. And then going from that and learning that way to now going to this where it, you weren't rewarded for the work you put in, it was beyond frustrating. Mike, I ended up signing with Ottawa. We mentioned earlier. And then you get sent back down to Belleville. It was your first time in the minors in about 10 years. Did that kind of light a fire under your ass? Because you had like, Yeah, what's 20, up with <laughs> Ottawa? I've been 20, hearing, like, I hear, like, good and bad things. Like, not maybe not so good. Good group of guys. Good group of guys, for sure. Fun group of young guys. Um, you know, they're they're on their way. Like, they're going to be they're gonna be good. You know, they've made some some good uh, additions. Yeah, I, I went to Belleville and absolutely tore it up completely tore it up and same thing. I couldn't get called back up. They, I was told that, you know, they had to shake things up with the team. We weren't playing well. And because I was liked as a teammate, um, especially with the young guys and I was a, an influence on them that, um, they sent me down. I was the scapegoat. Yeah, I, exactly. This isn't the NHL. I go, I look, you go back, look at my numbers, not even just in Belva, look at my numbers in Ottawa that year. I had phenomenal numbers and I wasn't playing power play. I wasn't eating minutes. I was in a, you know, a limited role and we were, weren't a very good team. Um, every other that, game. Yep. Right. And then, I mean, and then, the and then defense are not playing power play. I had, yeah, exactly. Exactly. And, I, and on a team that doesn't really score much, that doesn't score often and isn't a great team. And I think in Belleville, I set the franchise record for, for goals by a defenseman in like 20 games or something. I like, said so like something outrageous. They got to the point I was like, like, I'd be looking at the stats and I was laughing to myself. Like, how is like, what the fuck is going on right now? Like, is no one else seeing this? This is this isn't normal. I, I felt like I was living in a in a nightmare. Um, as far as the being out when you're up in Ottawa, like the organization itself, like what? Yeah, I, I, we had you know I went from New York. I always, I always New York is the best of the best, right? Toronto is, is there as well, but I, I only know New York because I played there. After games, you would have the most outrageous spread of food you could think, and anything you want, and no one no one went there because you're in New York City. You go out for dinner after the game. There's you know, millions and millions of restaurants and there's so many places to try and you get, again, you get access to new restaurant openings and whatnot. So you're always treated well there. In Ottawa, I remember after my first game, we had, <laughs> we had boxed quesadillas in a warming drawer. And, 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 you, and, and we're in Ottawa. So it's not, you know, during the week, I, I, after 9 p.m., maybe even 8 p.m., there's no restaurants open. So if you're not eating that food, you're going you know, you're going to McDonald's, you're going to some fast food place. I remember looking around, I'm like, it's like, you know, where's Ashton Kutcher? I got to be getting pranked right now. Like, this is like, got to be getting punked. This is, this is absurd. Boxed quesadillas in a warming drawer. And then I think, honestly, I think that might've been the moment. I'm like, you know what? I think, I think it's time. I think it's time we hang them up. Like, this is exactly. time in your career. You're like, I think yeah, this exactly. is, like, call this your this brother. Is, you're like, I not- think this is actually it. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly. I'd be going to DeVry Institute over this. Like, you know, give me a break. I guess it's like, this is not what I signed up for. Um, any other, uh, cr- oh, I was going to ask any other crazy plans now that you're retired? Like, do you want to go? I mean, I, I, I always check out your Instagram. You're always traveling around, traveling the world. Like any crazy experiences you want to go through now that you're retired? Uh, just more travel. I love traveling. I'll travel solo. I actually, you know, prefer that. I had an amazing trip with my, uh, with my parents. I went, I went to Europe for a month in, in May. This is, this was an amazing summer. I knew I was retiring at the end of the year. So this summer was, you know, I just kind of enjoyed myself, caught up with buddies that I haven't uh, been able to over the however many years, spent a, a ton of time in New York where my nephews are now. Um, continue to travel and now starting to, you know, pursue some of the other business opportunities that I've been, um, you know, preparing for uh, over the last few years. I have the real estate license, with, which I mentioned uh, here in Florida. Um, I'm the global ambassador of sport for a company called All Access. They, they curate basically bucket list um, uh, golf trips for whether it's four guys, eight guys, 16 guys all over the world. You want to go to oh, Scotland, shit. you want to go to Ireland, you want to go to Australia, wherever you, wherever you want to go from the moment you land to the moment you leave from uh, transportation, accommodations, um, tea times, everything is handled. The white glove service. Wow. Um, so that's super cool. Um, Box quesadillas when you get there. Yeah, they, they, <laughs> those will not be there. Those will not be there. And then Say the name one of, of that the, again. 
Yeah, all access. All okay. access. We got they're, a bunch of golfers web- that listen to this. Yeah, their their website is all access GTE. Um, and then one of the ones I'm most excited about, just over the last couple of years, really tr- you know truly enjoying and, and cherishing the mentor role. Um, I want to stay involved in the in the game of hockey in in some scale. Um, you know, you see guys, especially the young guys now, they're making so much money at such a young age. And, you know, that's a whole other conversation. You're either getting paid off uh, prediction as opposed to production, which I don't agree with. I didn't come into into the game at, at, at that point. But um, I want to be able to help with these guys. A lot of these guys, all they care about is focusing on hockey, which I get. But being able to educate them on the wealth management side, on how to save properly, how to budget properly. So I'm doing some work with... Um, with TSG, it's a wealth management group out of uh, out of Newport Beach, actually. So helping on the mentoring of these guys to with financial planning and setting themselves up for when they're done. Because as much as we we think we're going to play forever, there's going to be a time where that that uh, that doesn't happen. And making sure they're set up, their families are set up, and the next generations of their family are are, are taken care of. Uh, what's been your favorite vacation spot overseas? Oof, um, probably Greece. Yeah. Yeah, the Mykonos. Mykonos. Islands. Yeah, Mykonos and Santorini. Yeah, it's yeah. expensive as shit there, though, isn't it? It is. Any anywhere you travel to, that's nice. Is expensive. <laughs> well, I heard Mykonos is just on a different level because you yeah, go to those yeah. like you go to those like lunch spots and they and they got the beats going, and the next thing you know, it's dinner time, and you get your bill and it's, you're thirty k deep. Oh, yeah, there's a couple yeah, scam the, artists the, uh, on that. Yeah, yeah the the uh, the beach parties. I mean, that's what you go there for. This gets good deals in Juarez. He goes to Juarez, <laughs> Mexico. And gets his I don't even know where that is. It's beautiful. <laughs> yeah, is it? Uh, what is yeah, it? Where the beautiful. cartels hanging out? He, yeah, he has subway. Well, at least there I get shit. free wolf. <laughs> <laughs> that's yeah, how like, ra put, hangs out he's got a timeshare uh, there i i don't know what you're talking about paul Hello, let's move it along uh, <laughs> Deli, what uh, what kind of setup you have with the dj is it all digital or do you have a little vinyl mixed in there as well no digital i'm new all, school i'm new okay. school yeah yeah i apologize old school I on the contracts new school on the <laughs> yeah, exactly I'm, I'm, I'm the best of both worlds it, it depends what you're looking for but I, I got a little bit of both what do you most likely plan if I showed up in your DJ? And what, what are we going to hear most likely? I know you're into more of like the rock, old school stuff. For me, it's it's mostly house and some hip hop. I'm playing to the the new generation, but I like to mix in. Um, I grew up like my, my parents listened to disco, so Earth, Wind, and Fire, Bee Gees. I I love that. So mixing that into you know an upbeat house song is is my favorite. I love being able to sing. Uh, my voice is horrendous, but I enjoy singing and enjoy like feeling the music in, in that regard. So being able to blend it too, I enjoy. Hey, are, are you at home right now? Can we hear you play the sax a little bit? I don't. My sax is not with me or else I, or I would. Fuck. Trust me, I would have. Oh. That's the problem. When I had my house in Toronto, you could play because you don't have to worry about the noise. But now being in a condo, um, you know, the noise complaints uh, what? will be kicked out of here pretty if, quickly. If I missed it, are you in Miami? What part of Florida? I'm, I'm in Miami. Yeah, I'm in Miami. Nice. Nice. Yeah. Yeah. Will you, will you try to like, will you try to DJ down there at all? Is it, it's probably yeah. so hard. Okay, cool. No, nah, not really. There's so many opportunities here. There's oh, nice. I mean, Miami is the, you know, is what New York used to be. There's the nightlife here, the, the access to not just the nightclubs, but you have so many restaurants, all these restaurants are now are turning into supper clubs, right? So they're having live DJs that are actually playing while, while you're eating. So there, there's so many opportunities that are here. Damn, maybe I got to move to Miami. I was thinking about going out there for the month of March because we got you were. The, Well, yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, yeah, I still haven't like booked my place. I didn't know where <laughs> I was going to stay in Florida, but maybe Miami's got to be the spot because I got to, twice a week. I got to do the TNT gig Wednesdays and Sundays. So maybe I could hum in there and maybe yeah, maybe we could do a again, dual dude. set. Yeah. Get the disco open going. invite. <laughs> open open <laughs> invite. Yeah. Make what sure happened? One spit t- and chicken. One oh, bitch moved to Miami. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> disco biscuits. <laughs> <laughs> Make sure it's a one-way ticket. Like we got room for you here, though. All right, buddy. All right, DC. What a run, though, man. Uh, yeah. Fuck, dude. Like over seven hundred games. Just an amazing career, and and some of those stories of really battling through some tough times. It's pretty impressive. So congratulations on everything. Thank you. I appreciate that. I appreciate that. And it's a pleasure to talk to you guys. I know it's been a long time here getting me on, yeah. but I wanted to wait for uh, for the retirement and. And you guys were the were the first one. So very fresh, but uh, appreciative of you guys taking the time with me. We appreciate DJ it as well. Del Zotto. <laughs> <laughs> Best of luck every time, my man. Thanks, boys. Appreciate it. Appreciate it. Thank you so much to Michael Del Zotto. Crushing life down in Florida right now. That stallion. So we appreciate you coming on so much. Hope you guys enjoyed that interview. And boys, uh, I'm a dead man walking right now. So we started recording. Um, And my wife made a beautiful-looking lasagna. 
This thing looked incredible. Oh, no. And she took the boys down to hockey. And she said, Ryan, I need you to set an alarm on your phone and take oh. this out in 20 minutes. And then she called right when she said, left and said, Ryan, set an alarm on your phone. Why the fuck didn't I just set the alarm on the phone? Because we just got up to take a little pee break. And I screamed, oh, my God. Oh. This thing is burnt to a fucking no, crisp. No. I'm talking legit just black crisp. And I called her. I said, I never set an alarm. <laughs> and she immediately hung up. Are you sure you didn't? And it, and it just might have fucked you up. I set an, R, I set an RA alarm. <laughs> Like I, 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 I hope this it's podcast all goes. Full into, circle. I, this podcast better go another seven hours because I can't but, go downstairs. Yeah, I, what? Oh God, what's the, what do you think the punishment's going to be? No dinner, among other things. I mean, oh, buddy, <laughs> certainly no loving. This is one of those like husband mistakes where like I deservingly so. I'm, I'm probably catching attitude for a couple days now. You couple know? It's days, like, come on. Nah, a couple of days. I, you know what I'll do? I'll really like try to make her laugh. Like if you, oh. if your wife's <laughs> furious at her, just do your best to make her laugh because like it might help you. Even one percent makes a difference, right? So maybe I'll go down and just try to be a real goofball. Go down. Oh, 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 no, oh go down. Yeah, no, not the other way. Um, that that wouldn't help. Do, like, is this something that like a purse could solve? Is that too much of a? Nah, fuck that. I'm not going that heavy. Okay. Christmas is coming up. Okay, okay, little fair enough. bag, little Birkin bag action. Maybe give a little, maybe give her a little stocking just, stuffer. A little stocking I'm, I'm stuffer. I'm mad because I wanted it. I want, I wanted the lasagna. Well, I know. Like, I'm more mad. Like I don't have dinner now. Well, neither does she, and she's the one who told you to set the alarm twice, and twice. I get her frustration. I probably hit you with divorce papers, but that's just me. I said, I said, I'm Why'd really, want, really want, sorry. Want you don't I like feel so no, that was bad. Her, that was her oh. fucking whip is. Oh, what? I don't think you like my divorce joke. I gave him the price is right. Hold on. Oh, I didn't hear you. I was reading. I'm really, really sorry. I feel so bad. I'm very appreciative of you making that, and I couldn't wait to eat it. I'm so <laughs> mad at myself. And I got back. Don't want to hear it. So, <laughs> such passion. That's all right, guys. <laughs> That's all right. You live in your own fault. And you, you know whose fault this is? You know whose fault this really is, though? RAs for bumping the podcast back. Exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Exactly. Because I Shorzy, bumped, I, Shorzy I fucked the set of lasagna. RA had to fly home today. So this is on you, RA. Yeah, because that caused you to not set your own. Yeah, it's your <laughs> fault. You yeah, make the producer 100%. stay up extra late. This is all oh, on you. Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> First time ever. I done it. I right, brought over right some plain food for you. <laughs> what is that goldfish? Wait, wait, we didn't talk. I the, wait. We've been doing the show almost eight years. The first time we've ever sat together next to each other on a flight was uh, coming home from Atlanta. Did, can you believe the first time ever? That, we never really? talked about that. Yeah, we never sat next to each other on a flight before. I, right? You were, I, sit, we you were sitting economy with. We did sit next to each other once. Well, uh, not including private jets. I mean, no, oh, no, okay. on another one. Really? Uh, we flew to New York and we sat next to each other, like middle, middle of the plane. Oh, uh, well, either way, uh, Biz, your boy Tyson Barry, he's been uh, given permission to seek oh, trade no. partners. Uh, he was scratched versus the Rangers Saturday night, but it was only the first game he's missed all year. Incredibly, he's like what eighteen fifty one time of time of ice average, third among defensemen on the team. He's been playing pretty well for them. I was kind of surprised this report come out. What uh, what's your take on it, Biz? Do you think uh, has he been unhappy since he got there? I'm not asking you to divulge anything; it's just your your opinion of what you've seen so far, because he's really contributed to them uh, quite a bit so far. Yeah, and I mean, he got picked up last year, and it seemed as if though that might have had a a, a part of of why uh, his buddy there uh, ended up coming over from Toronto. Ryan O'Reilly. Ryan O'Reilly. Yeah. Thank you for reminding me of his name. And uh, I don't know. I it's a you, you, you think about Trotz and the way that he likes his players. I mean, obviously, I probably question, you know, whether that makes sense. I mean, Tyson's a very uh, offensive-oriented guy. Uh, but yeah, like you said, I didn't think I didn't notice anything that was out of the norm as to why something like this would come up. Maybe 
I mean, I can't see him not being happy with the ice time because you just mentioned it. Uh, I mean, point productions maybe a little below than what he were, where he was, especially with like the Colorado days and stuff like that. And then, of course, when he went over and played with McDavid with the Oilers, but they also don't have the type of offense that those teams have. So maybe there's a team that has more of an offensive mindset and needs a puck mover and they're desperate where it could work out. But yes, I was surprised when this headline came out. So Bane Pettinger, his, his agent now, and I think he took over, whether it was in the offseason or maybe during last year, uh, he's going to have his work cut out for him moving him over. Because I want to say that Tyson's making $4 million bucks, And with a, with a hard cap, man, that's going to be four tough point to five. Yeah, four four point five. Cap. Yeah. So there you go. It's just weird to me that, like, like why just why wouldn't you, you do this at the deadline or something? And then making it clear and open that he's allowed to start talking to teams and his agents allowed to do work, it almost hurts your return that you'd get for him opposed to trying to do it behind the scenes so when the whole thing was made public considering he's ufa at the end of the year i just i just thought it was odd like you don't see this happen that often no no uh also uh if there's bane pettinger if he's your agent he'll also be a bouncer at your wedding did you hear that uh tyson he had a couple of stragglers that showed up at his wedding and bane walked over he's like hey uh who do you guys know he's like oh we're, we're uh cousins with uh one of bane's friends he's like yeah well i'm bane he's like uh <laughs> oh, and they're no. like Arr! and they're like oh, uh, no. why don't you guys just like skedaddle here uh, well they I, took I over sh- the city of victoria when it was there and, and i mean the, the we, we, we we sent over the list it was like mcdavid somebody said ryan reynolds showed up i don't know if that was true bieber was on the guest list so there was some big swing and dicks that came in so no wonder there was some stragglers fuck if i was if i was on the island i would have been trying to sneak into the wedding bieber was at tyson barry's wedding no, I think that there was an invitation. He might have showed up for one part of it, but there was like rumors surfacing because like Mike Smith, uh, all the all the big dog hockey players were there. Uh, uh, Braden Shen, Sidney Crosby, McDavid. So like this, you know, the big swing and hockey dicks. And then with his connection to Toronto and meeting Biebs there, I'm pretty sure he did get the invitation. Wow. So I, I had know. to toss a wedding crash at, at, at my wedding too. I looked over and there was a dude I just like, I know I didn't know him. I know I've been, hey, what's up? He's like, hey, what's going on? I'm like, uh, who you hit? And he's like, oh, uh, I was like, buddy. Just open like, bar? So the guy yeah, who yeah, sneaks yeah, into every on. Stanley Cup celebration, celebration is kicking out wedding crashers? I feel like you would have invited him right in. Yeah, buddy, it's my wedding, dude. Like, I don't know him. It's crashing. their cup celebration. <laughs> we should have done better. <laughs> I wouldn't, yeah, have, exactly. I wouldn't have got him tossed out of there. But yeah, no, it was nice. I didn't make a scene about it. I say, buddy, just, you know, skid that all out of here. Get the fuck out of here. You got any, you got any wolf? No. Okay, get out of here. What do you guys think's uh, a good team that could uh, add Tyson? What do you I, think's I, a good team, G? I think the Devils because oh, Dougie Hamilton's out oh, okay, right now. Okay, they I mean, going to play nine defensemen? They got this fucking... Well, Dougie Luke. Hamilton's out right now. You need a puck-moving defenseman back. Luke they got Hughes, that baby. new kid. They got well, Luke, Luke Hughes. Hughes. If he keeps taking hits like he has been, he's not going to be playing. What about well, who's the other Nemec? kid? Two assists in Nemec. his first game this year. There you year. go. Very true. Very true. Um, power play defenseman needed somewhere? Uh, maybe Mini because... Back it, to Toronto? Spur- no, no, Mini doesn't. Spurgeon. <laughs> I, I don't know. That's a tough one. Florida would Florida be a good option? No, they got two. They got Ekblad and they got Montour, and their decor has been playing well. I wouldn't change a thing there. I don't know. We'll we'll, we'll think about it and speculate and, and get back to you. And by then, he'll probably move, be moved. A uh, couple of quick signings here. Uh, Winnipeg signed uh, Nino Niederreiter to a three-year, $12 million extension. He'll be 34 when the deal ends. Uh, the Habs extended goalie Samuel Montembeau, three-year, $9.45 million extension as well. Uh, congrats to uh, T- Tristan Jarry, a uh, first goalie goal in f- Penguins history. What a fucking snipe, too, man. I mean, they were up a goal, too. It wasn't like they had the two-goal lead where you can kind of roll the dice a little bit. It was like a one-timer. Poof, fucking boom. Uh, almost, uh, what, 190 foot right on sp- Fucking split the uprights right in the middle of the net. Great stuff. Good to see. Always love to see a goalie goal. Uh, we got a couple upstarts this year we got to talk about, Biz. Of course, I mean, we know we stroke your yotes off all the time, but right now they're 12-9-2, 26 points. They have in the first wild card spot, just two points back of Winnipeg uh, for third place in the, uh, what's what do you call it, Central. 7-4-0 at the mullet. Uh, they've outscored uh, teams 13-5 over their current four-game winning streak at a huge Huge reason for this is Connor Ingram. Uh, absolute tear. He's been on this season. The 26-year-old from Saskatoon. 
He's 10 and 3, I'm sorry, 10 3 and 0 with a 2 4 0 goes against a 9 2 6 save percentage. One shutout. Uh, no surprise, Clayton Keller leading the pack with scoring uh, 21 goals in 23 games played. Biz, have you been seeing these guys play a bunch? I know you always travel. I haven't been to the mullet yet. I was going to go the other night with uh, uh, Jordan Schmaltz and uh, Heat Daddy. Uh, they, they, they were mic'd up along the glass, so they've been doing some fun stuff with them. But uh, no, I haven't had a chance because most of the time when I get here, I'm just kind of chilling out and watching hockey on my phone and not going into the, the chaos. But I will. And 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 they deserve a, a tire pump. And the stat is that haven't they beat the last four Stanley Cup champions yes. on this four-game win streak? Insane. And they have an opportunity uh, on Monday to do so against the Washington Capitals to make it five in a row, which I mean, I don't know how the I don't know how the Caps keep winning with the power play the way it is. I mean, oh. I mean, you will get to it. It's probably that fucking goaltender lingering. Oh. Uh, but the, the a couple a couple of guys that have kind of come out of nowhere is that Carcone, Michael Carcone, played in the American Hockey League all over the place, and then he's finally gotten his opportunity. The guy's got what eleven goals so far in the season. So this guy came out of nowhere. He's kind of like their new Michael Bunting. We make players famous, and then some people steal them from us. Not very fun. And then another guy who's been fucking buzzing around. I, I, I've talked about him last year. Michele. Matthias Michele. And just the way he's able to dish that puck, man, he's been fucking buzzing upside down. But, um, the, I mean, Kells and Schmaltzy, too. I mean, those are the two guys. But overall, the team just plays their fucking balls off. Um, and a crazy thing to say is, on 32 Thoughts, gee, you brought it up that they are looked to be potential buyers at the deadline, maybe going after Noah Hannafin. So this to me is, I've said it, there's always that, that that you you I think you mentioned it with the, the Flyers earlier on, Wit, where you're saying, I don't know if fans want to see this because all of a sudden if you find yourself in that 15th spot or, or the 17th spot and you're fucking drafting a shitty draft pick and you're outside of playoffs, but at what point you say, hey, we got to start winning some fucking hockey games and and, and teach these guys and, and, and establish a winning culture. So I look like an idiot right now. They are in a playoff position, if I'm not mistaken, in a wild card. So if they keep playing and they surprise people, this is the weakest division in hockey too. So if they do end up pulling it off, I guess I won't be too shocked. But it's uh, it should be interesting down the stretch. But if Ingram play, keeps playing the way he has, look out, man. The Desert Dogs are going to be sniffing another playoff spot. It, it was a huge offseason, right? You get you get Kerfoot, uh, Dumba's in there. Um, you get uh, Zucker. Zucker. Um, uh, who else am I forgetting? Uh, another D-man. Maybe another um, forward. I don't remember. But they're that. bringing in vets, right? What is it here? Well, Bukestad, oh, who, who, Bukestad. Bukestad. They already had him, and then they chipped him off yeah, the deadline. Yeah, but to get him back from Edmonton, like, they're bringing in... And then they they brought Jersey over, so it's like... They got some guys in there, been in the league a long time. They have a superstar rookie, and they're getting great goaltending. So it's a cool story, considering their home ice advantage is pretty legit. The place is bonkers. It seems like everyone loves playing there. And I like seeing this team do good, and I actually like watching them play. Surprisingly enough, as you mentioned, they're going against the Capitals and, and Kuznetsov scratched, healthy scratch tonight. So that's a little wild. It was called a mental reset by Spencer Carberry. Ooh, so I like that term. I mean, the fact the Capitals are, are doing this with their leading score having like 10 points, I don't know if this can last. But it's interesting that you got this team on the up. You got this young group, brings in a couple vets, and they're going. They're playing the Capitals that seem to be on the way down, but somehow they're winning this year. So... It's an interesting matchup. Carcone and Matthias Michele. Carcone. They're like the Italian national team. And they could give you a tour at the Coliseum in the summertime because that's their Not side really. hustle. And don't overcook the lasagna. <laughs> no, I want it a little al dente, but not burnt to a crisp. Come on, Whitney. <laughs> Fuck, I'm going to have fucking someone else start our cars for you. Keep, keep this shit up. 12-7 uh, and two-third in the Metro. But the thing is crazy with 31st with uh, 2.45 goals per game. Their power play is dead last in the NHL. They've got four power play goals in the season. They went 34 power plays without a goal. Uh, penalty kill and 14th, kind of middle of the pack. But the story for the Capitals, a 29-year-old undrafted goalie, Charlie Lindgren, uh, he's kept them afloat. Seven starts, he's 5-2, and 2-3-0 two, uh, two, goals against 9-3-4 save percentage, a one shutout. He beat Vegas in that shutout. He's got one more year left at 1.1. This guy has to be the best back in the league right now, Biz, no? $1.1 million, like basically carrying this team right now. Yeah, he's the answer as to why you look at all their other offensive numbers and their power play, and you're like, how the fuck do they have any, any dubs in the win call? Them. 
that th- this is the reason why. And, you know, uh, K- Kemper hasn't exactly been the same Kemper as we saw in Colorado and especially not the Kemper that we saw in Arizona when he was making 40, 45 saves every night. But uh, in the meantime, he's definitely slapped the Band-Aid on the squad and he is making some 10-bell saves. So great to see. And, I mean, that's kind of, you know, that's part of the story is, is you know, some getting some great production from cheap goaltenders you just mentioned ingram and now you got this kid who's kicking in uh in washington so great story ra i love it and uh that's pretty much all i got well I, and i wonder can too, it can last he, though can he be the next alex lyon though uh what like talking about last year now alex lyon was undrafted like lindgren he turned 30 last december lindgren is going to turn 30 this month on the 18th and they're both from minnesota just a wild wild coincidences though huh three major coincidences for like sure that. Like Absolutely. crazy stuff. So, you know, Ovi obviously lead the team in scoring. They, they're not scoring a ton. Uh, congrats, to, obviously, to Tom Wilson. First career hat trick in his 700th game. So a little uh, salute to fucking I mean, Willie Lion did one. it for 15 games, though. Like, this is yeah, this it's, is the it's entire season. So. It, it It is. It's early, but he's doing it right now. So uh, we got to give him a little props for that. Uh, last week, we had the Kachuk Bowl. Grant, that we re- recorded Monday night. Uh <laughs> Wild stuff, wild stuff. We had Ottawa, Florida. Dude, how fucking hilarious. We had uh, Jake Sanderson and Matty Kachuk going at it. Brady Kachuk did down late with six, seven minutes left of therapy. I'd just brings the whole fight into it. Ten guys get the fucking uh, misconduct. The funniest part of the whole thing, though, is, is Nana Jerry Kachuk with the arms folded. She and was then, disgusted. But disgusted. Then, then Matty with the arms folded the exact same way. You talk about genetics. It's just, like, hilarious. Just, like, the arms went the exact same way. Uh, Big Walt sitting there looking along. I don't think he was too disappointed at all. But have you ever seen this biz uh, or, or wit, uh, 10 misconducts? Every guy in the ice got a misconduct. Have you, have you ever been part of that? Or seen it was that a before? little excessive. Yeah, I've been through yeah. through a few of those. Just when they think that things are out of hand, just calm it all down to the end of the game and, and get everybody the fuck home. Yeah, 161 penalty minutes. 151 of them came in the third. Uh, and also, yeah, like I said, Brady and Matthew, they're forbidden by by my. Uh, Chantel does not want them to fight. They were obviously barking back and forth with each other. Uh, certainly entertaining to watch. And then later in the week, the Panthers played Florida. We had uh, Sam Bennett and Max Domi. I mean, Bennett the Panthers played Florida. They played themselves? I'm sorry, yeah, Panthers played Toronto. I like to play with myself. <laughs> yeah, it was, it was a red white <laughs> red so white scrimmage. We have so a lot in common. T- Toronto later in the week. It was that was the game where Rodriguez double tapped the uh you know, the shootout goal, they had to bring everybody back onto the ice. I had never seen that since they brought the shootout on. Where everybody was in the locker room, had to bring them all the way back out. Toronto ends up winning the game. Have you have you recall anything like that with, since we've had the shootout in the league where the, the refs had to wait and, and overdo a call like that? Uh, no, I do not. Um, I don't remember that. I, I, I guess they got the call right. I don't know what you thought, Biz. It looked like he just kind of got that second whack at it, but... It's tough to, to actually like go back and look at it and then like, oh, it didn't count. Like I was kind of surprised. You know what I, I think? I guess, what? Fuck the shootout. The shootout can suck my dick. Yeah, I hate the shootout. Aggressive. I think everyone hates the shootout. You yeah. hear me, Wit? The I shootout mean, the, the can suck won. my dick. I thought you'd dick. be happy. Oh, I thought no, your, no, uh, your, your, your Leafs winning would be, would be a good thing. You know after- what's been the coolest thing about the Leafs is at – Every point this season when they've needed either Nylander, Matthews, or Marner to step up, they have. These guys are a one-man fucking show. And when playoff comes around, they're going to all put it together collectively. They're going to get goaltending. They're going to get Tanev in there. And they're going to shove it so far up your fucking ass, your lasagna is going to burn again, motherfucker. You're a shtick. <laughs> they have five wins in regulation, which is oh, which is okay, which is Pasha. trash. Okay, trash. Pasha. Montreal has okay. four, and then there's Toronto with five. Yeah, Ottawa be, has eight hey, or nine. I might be cheating on my old lady with Vancouver, but at least I ain't leaving her. Well, you know what? I really could give two oh, fucks sure because great. if hey, you actually you're think a this fucking uh, home wrecker, if if you actually you're think a fucking lasagna. Overcooking home wrecker, you piece of shit. <laughs> and you're a whore. I'd rather be a bad cook than a whore. And if you think the Leafs are going to win the Stanley Cup, you're smoking RA shit. Who gives more than a ever. fuck? Then Vancouver will, my other little slut. And if it ain't that slut, it's my little slut in Los Angeles. I'm just a little hockey whore, am I? I? <laughs> if only you had some futures on all of them, like I did. <laughs> If you can't say the Leafs are worrying you a little, you're a phony piece I of shit. I ain't worrying until we hit first round of fucking playoffs, baby. I ain't stressing for shit. I got enough stress in my life. 
dealing with fucking Rear Admiral showing I'm up at nine o'clock for a seven this. o'clock recording. <laughs> If you lose a fight like that, though, can you actually like rank on a guy's hairline if you if you like take that many to the face? I mean, so I think that was he just checking his because maybe it gotten grabbed, or you think that he was mocking Sam Bennett's I, lack of hair? I mean, he didn't pull his hair; it wouldn't be like missing. Oh, I, mean, I didn't know. I yeah. didn't know. I didn't see it. I was kind of just being a biased idiot over here. Uh, I thought I thought he was like goofing on his bald head, but I don't know, man. When it, when a guy puts a fucking a spank on you like that, ranking on his hair, I don't know. I think I, think I don't the fact know. He just lost Regardless the fight, of, of how it. Domi handled it, I would have also been embarrassed. I probably would have done something silly. And Sam Bennett is the last guy I'd want to run into <laughs> in a back alley. That is one bad motherfucker. He was choking him with. He was. He went Tim Jackman. He went he straight hammering. Timmy. He was hammering away. He looks like a Deadwood stunt double with that fucking like San Francisco 49 a gold gold speed lunk and mustache. Was that the same up. game that uh Keith was just giving it to the bench? Yeah. Just yes. Screaming I, yeah. at Bertuzzi. Yeah. I'm glad that you guys brought this up because it happened, I want to say, at the beginning of last year, and then he apologized in the post game scrum. No. These guys are old enough now. They've had enough years under their belt. If they want to play like dogs and they want to play like shit, Keith should be able to grab them in the locker room and say, Sh sit down, shut the fuck up, start playing defense, and start putting in 110% effort. These people in the Platinums have spent their life savings to come watch you, and you can't even fucking move up down the ice at plus uh, more than 80% here. Come on! Fucking dig in! Damn, and that's what he was telling him, and he should be fucking biz. telling him. Situational awareness. Is what Come I on, mentioned. man, get and some I, fucking floss earlier, in that goddamn locker room. Situational awareness for Kuzmenko. So you're just right on line with the whore in van and the wifey in Toronto. You know what we need? You're a giving him fucking... that same dick, Biz. I'll give him that fucking angry inch. Oh, oh, hey now. You want this angry inch? Before we go any further. I'm here to talk to you about Peter Millar. Yes, the Peter Millar that you see me wearing in every single sandbagger and any single time I'm on the golf course, I have Peter Millar on. And so it's obvious how much we love them. Their signature performance fabrics keep us looking and playing great on the course throughout the year. Spring, summer, fall, doesn't matter. While we rely on their performance polos and shorts to keep us cool during the summer, cool weather rounds call for a different approach. That's why we want to tell you about Peter Millar's all course line of outerwear. Their essential performance layers feature a loose fill insulation that provides the warmth you need without being bulky or heavy. You can't have too much on. You got to be able to swing. You got to be able to turn around that spine and release the golf club. And it's all possible with Peter Millar's all course line of outerwear. The fleece line sleeves feature four way stretch that moves with you during your swing. So you don't have to sacrifice your game for warmth. And to top it off, these outerwear pieces are windproof and water resistant, keeping you dry and warm if the weather turns. So be sure to check out the all course outerwear line at petermillar.com, the official outfitters of the USGA. So right now, check it out, petermillar.com and Get involved with the best golf wear in the business. All right, boys. Uh, I think that wraps up the hockey. I, G, we have uh, Surviving Barstool. Uh, it's uh, now available on pay-per-view. I know the first couple episodes were out there for free, but if you want to see a bunch of lunatics act like a bunch of lunatics, spend, it's what, two, a price of two cups of coffee, nine ninety nine pay-per-view. It's great shit. Wait, have you been following this? Surviving yes, Barstool? Yes, I have. I think it's some of the best co content, if not the best Barstool's ever put out. Just a whack pack of the big dogs at the company all hanging out together, all going at it. And I had never watched Survivor, so I, I didn't really understand like the rules in terms Same. of like, you know, voting guys off and just so much backstabbing. And it, it's 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 been great. They've done an awesome job with the production side. The, obviously the content's great with those characters and and I recommend it. And you know, people were all over me for saying yeah, people were flipping out. It's 10 bucks. They had to move it over to pay-per-view because um, of some issues with the YouTube and stuff. But people were flipping out saying that, that, that I'm an asshole and not everyone had Sid put money in their bank account. And fair enough. I, 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 I guess I, I didn't realize what 10 bucks meant to some people. But if you don't want to pay <laughs> the money in two weeks after the finale, it'll all be streamed for free. On Barstool.tv. And if you want to watch it live, uh, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday nights, uh, the last last week, this week, and next week, with the finale live in Chicago, I recommend uh, getting involved. Apparently, I've been told the in the episode this evening or last night, as you're listening on Tuesday, is, is worth 10 bucks on its own. So I know we pump Barstool. That's our company. Those are our people. And if you're a fan of, of Barstool at all, check it out because it, it's it's fun to watch. These, these people are tapped. All right, Sandbagger coming next week, too. Woo! 
Sandbagger, Sandbagger Jr. and Timu Solani. Stories with Solani and Jr. Wrap it up here. Uh, grind my gears. Uh, I actually delayed this one from a couple weeks ago. So it might be Who's a little- it presented by? bigdealbrewing.com slash finder. If you're looking for Big Deal Brewing near you, go to bigdealbrewing.com slash finder. And this was a couple weeks back, dude, like these fucking mutants on TikTok, uh, what they were like praising Osama bin Laden because like they went and found his like statement about America and like they were trying to justify like what he did fucking 9-11. It was like, and these these are American fucking people. Like how, like how much of a mutant do you have to be to like discover like a, a statement from fucking one of the biggest terrorists of all time and like try to justify what he did? It was abhorrent. Like, I was so muted. I'm, I'm so heated. I'm glad we actually pushed it because I would have fucking blew my top then. And, and I'm going to tie that in with all this other stuff we talked about earlier. Just these TikTok videos. Look, I get it. Like, it, it's huge. You make these fucking, like, clips and whatever. Everyone wants to go viral. But just fucking, like, have a little fucking integrity. Be accurate. The stuff with, like, the, the, the Corey Perry stuff. People that had nothing to do with hockey making these videos. Oh, this guy did this. And, you know, you, you could trip everyone out there, but it's like, it's like play a whack ball. Like, stop, stop saying this, stop saying that. People, just stop being fucking morons on TikTok. Stop praising terrorists and stop fucking making stuff about people's mothers that you don't know. Behave, act like a fucking adult on fucking TikTok. That's been grinding my gears for a long time. I had a fucking spout off today. Bigdealbrewing.com slash find it. Any final I love it. Boys RA, versus, RA versus misinformation. God, I didn't have that on my bingo card. And terrorism. Today. And terrorism. And terrorism. Oh. Fuck TikTok. And that's yeah. why we go right to a uh, YouTube channel. Fuck that bullshit. Uh, Wit, tonight, uh, it's very Boston-centric story. Actually, uh, G2, you're a little younger than us, but it's called uh, Mur- Murder in Boston. It's a documentary series coming on HBO about the Charles Stewart uh, story. It happened back in uh, 1990, 91. He it was, was a- my worst thing to ever come out of Boston after the duck shriveled you that time. Yeah. Yeah, he, yeah, Charles Stewart. It's a horrific story. It ties in with Boston's obviously, uh, you know, uh, complicated history. You may say I haven't seen it yet. Obviously, it's dropping live. It dropped last night. I'm gonna check it out. It looks very good. Uh, it's just a, it's an ugly part of, of the city's history. I, I love Boston, but you know, what's it all? I'm gonna watch it and check it out. And uh, Can once you tell I see me it, what the fuck you're talking about. What's I will. So ugly yep, about uh, it. Yeah, I'm gonna. So okay, this was back in 1990. Biz, uh, uh, this guy, he was a suburban hu- uh, husband, and he called up the police. He says, oh, it, his wife was eight months. Pregnant, they were leaving a birthing class. He says, "Oh, me and my wife have been shot," and the and the cops came and, and they this guy shot and in, inside his wife shot and she's dying, she's bleeding out, and he says, "Oh, a, a black guy shot us." So the cops like flipped the city upside down, looking for this black guy who shot this you know this this suburban you know, you know stereotypical suburban beautiful couple that got shot. Well, it turns out the guy was full of shit. Uh, he was trying to get the insurance money. It, it's a well-known story of Boston history, and this is like a deep dive documentary on it. Uh, HBO is doing. It looks really interesting, so I'm going to check it out. I think if you're not familiar, did somebody with history, go to prison? Uh, no, because well, I I, I don't want to say spoiler alert. Thirty years later, uh, it, things happen. I would advise you to watch it. And uh, people did go to prison, but it's a huge, complicated story. I would say watch it. I don't want to tell people what happened. I want okay. them to see it in their own in their own time and maybe react on their own thing without me kind of spoiling the waters father. But right. uh, it's a, it's a, it's a sorted story, but it's, it's an important story. So what uh, I want to let you know about that. You two G and our audience and YouTube is it, It's, I think it's definitely worth checking out. So any other final notes, boys, before you vamoose? No, I gotta go. I gotta go. You gotta go uh, take your lip, face lip the music, luck, guys. Buddy. Yeah. Hey, good luck. Should I record it and send you the recording? You know what you should do is you should go up there and play small town strip club for and really. No, you know what I can do? Yeah. I hear the kids. They're still awake. So I'll just go in. I'll put them to sleep and maybe I'll try to crack a joke or something. Try to fall asleep. I just ordered We'll we'll take the temperature of the room. We'll take the temperature of the room. All right, guys. All you listeners, thank you for listening. We got a long season ahead. We're thick in the middle of this this NHL run to the playoffs. And a lot more is going to go down and we'll be with you every step of the way. We love you all. And we appreciate you listening, and I hope you all have a fantastic week. Peace out.